uh, Vice Mayor Daddario to the dais, please. Vice Mayor Daddario, please come to the dais. Hello. It's yeah. We were waiting for Jackie. That's all. Nothing can start until Jackie comes. Okay, here we go. I was like waiting for a cue, but I guess I got it. Thank you very much. Okay, let's start off with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Councilmember Richens, will you help us out? Place your hand over your heart, repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Okay, so at this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Individuals wishing to address the city council are requested to complete a speaker card and deliver the speaker card to the city clerk prior to the item being heard by the city council. Please observe a three minute limit for communications and once called upon to speak, we request that you state your name and city of residence for the record. So the first item we'll go to is communications from the public. So I'll read something that sounds very similar to what I just read, but it'll be slightly different. Um, this portion of the agenda is uh, intended for general public comment only on items within the council's jurisdiction that are not listed elsewhere on the agenda. Please note that state law prohibits the city council from discussing or taking action on these items. Please observe a three, limit, three minute limit for communications and once called upon to speak, we request that you state your name and city of residence for the record. Ms. Edwards, are there any speaker cards for communications from the public? Mayor, no, I did not receive speaker cards. Great. Okay, so we're going to right into our agenda items. Up first is the Corona Streetcar Feasibility Study. Uh, Savat <coughs> Kampu, Public Works Director, will present a report. Good afternoon, Council. So presenting before you today is going to be the Corona Streetcar Feasibility Study. The ask of the council is, uh, do you wish to proceed with a Corona Street car feasibility study with TIG-M? Uh, some of the discussion points I'm going to go over this afternoon is um, explaining a little bit about TIG-M, uh, the company. The street car feasibility study that TIG-M is doing with the city of Riverside, uh, the proposed street car feasibility study that's being presented before you uh, this afternoon with the city of Corona. Um, the pros and cons of the uh, feasibility studies and direction from city council and options to consider. A little bit about TIGM um, LLC. They are a Chatsworth, uh, California based company that designs and builds wireless street railway systems. They actually have a contract with the city of Riverside. They were awarded a feasibility study uh, in the amount of $416,000. Um, on November 17th, 2020. Uh, their contract uh, was actually going until June 2021. Um, but it, um, so just as a, as a heads up, they actually presented to the city council, our, our um, committee of the whole on May 12th, 2021. So while they were performing those studies, they thought it advantageous to come present to the city on uh, a possible feasibility study with our city. So the streetcar feasibility study in Riverside was, um, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, they presented, um, introduced that concept to the city council in Riverside in February 25th, 2020. On October 6, 2020, the Riverside City Council gave direction to fund the streetcar feasibility study. And subsequently, on November 17th, 2020, TIGM was awarded a feasibility study on streetcar technology and funding options to service the city of Riverside. They were to bring back a report to its economic development, placemaking, branding, and marketing committee on the actual study, uh, the, the, the uh, cost of the funding options, and also the uh, 
possibility of uh, relocating TIGM's headquarters from Chatsworth to the city of Riverside. The report um, currently, although the original contract was scheduled to be um, due to the city in June 2021, um, the latest update from the city is that they're not going to deliver that report until summer of 2022, which is the reason why the delay of, of the updated presentation today, we were waiting for the status of the city of Riverside. TIGM's proposal for the Corona Streetcar Feasibility Study on May 12, 2021, uh, TIGM presented to the Committee of the Whole um, on the possible expansion to the City of Corona from the City of Riverside's light rail project. And uh, TIGM's proposal for Corona's study is $310,690. The pros and cons of the uh, feasibility study is presented here before you. Some of the pros are listed on your left side there. The Corona study would be um, current with the city, concurrent with the City of Riverside study. And um, it would also provide an alternative mode of public transit using clean energy. And also has the potential to complement the city's downtown revitalization plan. Uh, some of the cons that um, I've listed on the right side is that it's a high initial investment cost that may not be offset by fare box fees. And uh, currently, as presented to you, it is a sole source for the study and for the proposed design build with TIGM. And therefore, uh, it may not qualify for federal funds or subsidies in the future. And also, um, some of the complexities involved is that the coordination uh, of the approval required with the multiple agencies that it would go through, such as RTA, um, RCTC, and also the county jurisdictions, in addition to the city of Riverside and the city of Corona. So the direction sought from the city council is, does the city council wish to proceed with TIGM's proposal for a streetcar feasibility study? Some of the options to consider are um, as follows here. Option number one is to proceed with the Corona streetcar feasibility study with TIGM and fund the uh, $310,690 study using general funds. Um, again, because of the nature of the way it's being presented, we can only use general funds and not other sources. There is another source that we could use, and that's only $20,000 from another, but it was just significantly small, a small amount that I didn't include it in here. Number two is explore future grant opportunities for a streetcar feasibility study. And in doing so, uh, we would have to come back and solicit for uh, competitive bids, obviously, and ensure that um, TIGM would be aware of, of any proposals that we would be presenting. The recommended option is the third option, is really wait for the results of the City of Riverside's streetcar feasibility study and its plan path forward. Uh, the reason being is that um, uh, this the basis of the feasibility study for Riverside is to have their base there. And our uh, part would be more of an extension rather than uh, the primary, um, the line for, for the rail. That concludes my presentation. We also have uh, Mr. Brad Reed, uh, president of TIGM here to, uh, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Kampu. Go to my colleagues and Council Member Casillas. Uh, I don't have questions, but I do have comments. Is that what we're, yeah, we're at? Yeah, you're okay. good. Um, I, I'm excited. I'm always excited to explore different alternatives for transportation, especially in our region. And so I want to be supportive of innovative, um, of innovative approaches. However, this is absolutely an extension to Riverside's um, uh, line if Riverside decides to move forward with it. So, you know, I don't see the logic in spending money to to have a feasibility study now if we don't even know if Riverside will move forward to actually have this kind of transportation in their city. So I'm I'm in favor of staff's recommendation number three to hold off and wait to see what the results are for the city of Riverside. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Richens. Jackie always gets the best answers first. So uh, I, I'm in the line with uh, Jackie. I would, uh, I, I really do like the idea of a streetcar from Corona to Riverside for two reasons. One is because there used to be a streetcar from Corona to Riverside. And uh, two, it's a beautiful, beautiful ride if you can go down Magnolia from Corona to, uh, 
to Riverside. Magnolia Street is famous for how pretty it can be. So to take a streetcar through there would be incredible. When they built our city, um, we were South Riverside at that time. And they actually intentionally built Magnolia from Riverside to Corona. It was like one of the first things they did. So there's a lot of historical purposes. But uh, just wait and see what Riverside does and then come back and reevaluate. Thank you, sir. Vice Mayor? Uh, yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. I'd like to wait and see what happens and go from there. Okay. I'm, uh, I think the, the, the comments are unanimous. I think that um, same thing. I, I like the idea of having additional options uh, to move around. It's one of the things I complain about a lot that we don't have a functional uh, light rail system, even though this would, it would get us at least a piece. But again, I'd be interested to see what uh, Riverside does and then um, how exactly that, their program, what it's, what it's centered on. I know that I see the loops and transporting people between UCR and downtown and a couple of the places in between makes perfect sense for them. For us, it's where would we be going besides to Riverside? So not that I'm against that based on, and I agree with Councilmember Richens. I, you know, when I tell people when you drive down on uh, Magnolia and you notice how wide the medians are, and that's that's why because that's where the that's where those uh, those car, those cars were. So, um, with that, I think if I didn't hear any, I really didn't hear any questions. So I think uh, I think we're unanimous. Um, but Ms. Edwards, do we have any speaker cards? Mayor, yes, I do. I have one speaker card for the item. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. So uh, Riverside has had various forms of streetcars and shuttles and trolleys and things over, and they've been pretty useful around there. Going back and forth between places that have crowds that travel en masse from point A to point B. So between UCR, you have a whole bunch of people looking for entertainment and food and dining, and they travel to downtown. So the trolleys and buses and various you know methods of conveyance are very successful in that case. We don't have that same situation here. We don't have a place where we have thousands of people looking to get someplace to the same place, unless you want to do a streetcar to Irvine or something. But it's, it's we don't really have the same situation. And and you know, yeah, Magnolia can be beautiful. So can Victoria. But this isn't really you know. If you look at the difficulty in uh, trying to keep the bus service relevant, you know, and how hard it is to change that. You don't have to pull tracks up to change the bus route, you know. So th this is you, you. You really need to have a, a set place with a set plan and a real and a demonstrated demand, or at least a plan to generate the demand to do a streetcar. You know, I, I, it. I struggle to imagine a case where somebody would get on somewhere along Sixth Street to go to downtown. I mean. I don't know that it would be faster than the bus, and it's kind of a hellscape riding a bus between cities. It takes hours to, to move from Corona to Riverside. Nobody that has another alternative would ever do that. I mean, it's one thing to do, you know, I mean, for an amusement just because you want to see the sights, but that's not going to be, that's not going to generate any funds around here. I mean, I, in a sort of a romantic sense, I kind of like the idea of having a streetcar and another amusement, and it's, you know, like another thing that we have here, but in a practical sense, I don't really see that. I can't possibly see the reason. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. So I think uh, you have your direction, Mr. Ellis. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, the vice mayor's um, favorite topic, at least of, uh, <laughs> so we're going to move that to the end. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about the Corona Municipal Airport update and visioning. So Dr. Turner, Community Service Director, and Cynthia Lara, Community Assistance Manager, will provide a report. Thank you so, so much, Mayor. Um, I was getting a little nervous uh, <laughs> that we were once again going to be put onto another agenda. So thank you for that. Um, I, we're really pleased to share this with you. It's been a long time in the works and um, really want to thank Cynthia Lara for her work around this. Um, she put a lot of time and effort into this um, presentation and hopefully it will explain some of the things we saw in the budget uh, at the spring workshop and hopefully um, mirror what your intent is for the Corona Municipal Airport. 
So I think this whole presentation is uh, structured to, to give you two kind of things. One, which is a visioning for the future, what can be possible, sort of our overarching philosophy of what we would like to see at the airport. The other is sort of this operations piece. So tan you know, what are the tangible things that we need to do to get to that sort of philosophical vision. So the vision is to build the relationships with the master leaseholders, businesses, and users. Um, the structure at the Corona Municipal Airport is that the city of Corona is uh, the master leaseholder, and we have, um, we have those who are master leaseholders under us. That's the way the parcels are broken up. And we need to continue to have conversations with folks at the airport about what um, expectations are and that they're holding their tenants accountable to those expectations. We want to have it be a welcoming space for our residents. Um, there are small municipal airports around Southern California. Many of them are closing. Um, Corona is, uh, Corona's airport offers a great opportunity for people to learn how to fly and ultimately to make that a career. Um, and so we want that to be welcoming for those who use the airport that way, but also for families who want to come and have breakfast on a Saturday morning and come out with their small children and watch planes take off and land. That's a very fun activity. I know it sounds kind of strange, but I know when my son was little, that was one of his favorite things to do, was to go out to the airport and just watch planes take off and land. And then really to create opportunities for regional events. So how do we tie the airport into um, our surrounding park space and how do we make that happen so that we can start using that as a facility for regional events? From an operations standpoint, we need to secure the airfield area. So our master leaseholders need the opportunity to feel that the investments that they're making are secure and folks don't just wander uh, into the airport and cruise around and kind of do whatever without some kind of security. We want to expand community access to the public spaces and we want to create multi-use and flexible areas. And then we want to do, um, since we have revenue coming in from the airport, we want to reinvest that revenue into capital improvements in the airport that make it um, both more welcoming and more usable and more secure. So we're gonna just do a quick overview. Um, so we talked about master leaseholders. We have three master leaseholders and six leased parcels. So CW Transportation um, has parcel one, which is about eight point uh, almost nine acres. It has 60 hangers on it and has 85 tie downs. We have Diamond Arrow Corporation, um, which has two parcels. They have parcel two and parcel six. And we have Corona Executive Hangers that has parcels three, four, and five. So we wanted to show you just kind of to give you a sense um, for those of you that haven't been out to the airport in a while, what those parcels look like. So the largest part of um, uh, of these parcels, they're all they're all combined. We, the city, are responsible for the taxiways and the runway, and then we're also obviously responsible for our own parcel, which is the city tie down, which is at the very end of the airport. It does have some surrounding property. You'll see that open space around our tie down, uh, and then the cafe is kind of right in front of. Uh, sort of in between the city tie down and parcel six. So if you've been to the restaurant there, that should kind of orient you to, to what we're looking at with regards to the parcels. So what are the authorized businesses? There are several businesses at the Corona Airport. They include the fueling station, uh, which is uh, owned and operated by CWT. Um, we have parcels two and six. We have the Corona Airport Cafe. We have the airport engines. We have Corona Air Paint Shop. We have the Flying Academy. All of the businesses listed here. Um, and parcel, parcel seven is obviously the city tie-down area that does not have any businesses, but parcels three, four, and five have aircraft interiors and California um, power systems, light sport, power systems, which is affiliated with Spruce Aircraft. 
So here's some visioning. What you'll see is a, an ode to the past and what we currently have at the Corona Airport. So just want to kind of give you some sense of that. When we're talking about this, we're talking about um, where can we go now from what we have. And so we are devoting some time here to fostering and sustaining relationships and open lines of communications with our master leaseholders. Some of the feedback we got uh, when we first got there was is that they'd like to know more kind of about what's happening at the airport, more information about what the city's doing, and, and understand more what the expectation is from the city. And so we are working really hard to make those relationships and have those conversations, making sure that our communication is clear and it always relates back down to the leases that they have. We wanna understand the needs uh, that they have as master leaseholders and create some common goals. So goals that are both in the interest of the city uh, and in the master leaseholders. And ultimately, we think the airport will be better and better serve the community if everyone's accountable to following their lease and using their hangars as hangars are supposed to be used and kind of making sure that we're getting back to that place where everybody is doing what they need to do. They know when we're coming out to inspect, they know what we're going to be looking for, and that we're just really clear um, about what the expectation is. And so um, they know what the expectation is and that the practice and the expectation align with each other. So master leaseholders activities, um, staff welcomed a new master leaseholder and they have already begun doing some improvements to the parcels um, that they have taken over. Um, and they're working on aesthetics on parcel one. Um, we want to um, change leads to synergy. So we want um, a new, a new, we have a new petition to allow parcels four and five to be assigned to a new master leaseholder, and that's under review right now. This is another person who's coming in from the outside who'd like to take over um, the master lease and is very interested in investing. Um, and we've been very clear about you know the length of time that the airport's open and what we're trying to do with regard to that. Um, and even with that constraint, they are very interested in coming to Corona, investing, uh, and, and really lifting up parcels four and five. Um, and then we see that this synergy is creating action. So the master leaseholders are enforcing the use of terms. Staff and the master leaseholders are working on a holistic plan to abate inoperable aircraft, which we know has been a concern. Uh, and we are working together, and that is really wonderful that that is synergistic between the two of us. And the master leaseholders are beginning to invest in maintenance because they're seeing that, that their investment is also being mirrored by the city's investment and the city really taking seriously what's happening at the airport. So in relationship building and capital investments that are currently underway. So um, the first thing that uh, we were aware of when we went out to the airport was that the asphalt was ready to be addressed. And so we, the city, felt that if we wanted the master leaseholders to address asphalt in their areas, we needed to show them that we were going to be investing and paving all of the public areas that, that we're responsible for. We believe that the best way to get people to work with us is to lead by example. Um, and so we are going to be repaving the runway, the taxiways, the apron, and Aviation Road as a part of the overall citywide paving project, and we're very excited about that. We're also uh, retrofitting the lighting on, uh, on the runways and taxiways. So we're thinking about how do we create opportunities for public spaces? You know, I have to tell you that um, I've, I've heard of an event called Wings and Wheels that used to happen at the airport. I've heard about the mud runs that used to happen at the airport. And so really trying to look at how do you bring back that synergy to the airport? How do you bring residents who are, who are not necessarily aviators um, to the airport and have that be a useful public space. So one of the things we've talked about is maybe creating um, an observation area. Um, this turf area uh, by the city's tie down would be ideal for that. 
Um, and it would just be for families literally to go to the cafe and have breakfast and then come to this observation area to see planes, you know, take off and land. Um, the long-term tie-down and turf areas could be repurposed at some point um, in the future for special events, but we, but there, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get later into the presentation. But that's going to take some, some real discussion with the Army Corps of Engineers about what is permissible and what is not, uh, and what we could do there. But, but that is a possibility for for future investigation. So security enhancements, I would say of everything that we're talking to you about today, this comes forward with great urgency to you. Um, so as we are asking master leaseholders to take a look and invest in their area and come to this airport, security continues to come up over and over again. Um, you know, I want to invest, I want to do this, but you know, how can I make sure that if I've got this very expensive plane here on a tie down or here in my hangar that not just anyone can, can walk through and, and do this. So we are proposing that we relocate the security gate from where it is um, to another location, which I'll show you quickly. Um, to protect the airfield and the leased areas. This will create opportunities that we can use the outside, you know, what is not blocked off by the security gate for those public spaces and places for people to engage. And then the, the places that are fully dedicated to, to aviation are secured and that there's a security gate there. So we would relocate the existing gate. We'd install additional fencing. We did stall an automated gate at the city tie-down entrance and um, assess the design of the observation area. Lighting upgrades, we would retrofit all the light fixtures at the airport. And then uh, for a helipad, we would construct a new FAA-approved landing pad. So we kind of got started on a helipad, and then it kind of never took off, and then it wasn't properly certified and all of that. So um, to protect the asset that we started investing in and never completed, we want to complete that helipad and have it meet all of the FAA requirements. And then work to create a security uh, camera system at the airport um, so uh, that we can keep an eye on, on what's happening uh, there. So this is a map for you to talk about where we have the existing gate. The existing gate is what is circled there, um, where we are proposing to move that gate onto Aviation Drive. So that would leave, as you can see, the city's area open for open, more open access. Um, it would create a proposed observation area and then possibly that event space, or we could at least in investigate that event space. What is those red lines is where we are proposing to add fencing, um, so that again, the investments that we're asking master leaseholders to make um, can be secured. We also want to just improve the look of the airport. So one of the things uh, and some of the feedback we got as we have been walking around, talking to master leaseholders, talking to those master leaseholder tenants, is that they feel like the airport doesn't look very inviting, that the, the landscaping isn't you know, beautiful, and that they would like it to look more intentional um, and be kept up differently. Um, and so we're looking to kind of create a cohesive aesthetic with standardized landscaping themes so that we can talk to the folks, the master leaseholders, so that we can do our public area, the area that belongs to the city, um, with certain landscaping themes and that they then can pull those themes through their areas if they have green space and areas that need to be landscaped that we're all creating one cohesive look uh, throughout the airport. Um, we want to revisit areas at the airport to determine how to implement the standards. So we're looking at the runway median. We're looking at the area, area between the runway and the north property line, the helipad area, the observation area, and the special events area. So what's our action plan? We are asking the council to give us some direction on an action plan and investment. So 
We are saying to you that we think that security measures is, is, is important. Um, and we're saying that the estimated time to complete what we are proposing is 18 months. Um, we're looking at securing the airfield and leased areas. We're, our estimate is approximately $200,000. Um, and that includes that relocation of the existing security gate, an addition of the chain link fence, and to install an automatic gate at the city tie down area. That includes the lighting improvements, the helipad improvements, and the security cameras. Um, and as you'll note, the airport does generate income, so these dollars are would be invested from airport funds for these for these improvements. Aesthetic improvements, um, we think that that would also take 18 months, um, and that can either happen simultaneously with the security measures or, that, or these can happen sequentially. Um, and we believe the aesthetic improvements include an entry monument sign, um, landscape design of the airport entry and turf area, parking and exploring parking, and then returning to council once we've gotten some design cost estimates, uh, and then request the allocation of funds. And then finally, public spaces. We believe that this will take about 24 months. We are really not ready at this time to, to move full, full guns into this, so, but this is an idea that we want to plant with the council, uh, and that is the observation area, the special events area, and then of course we would return back to the council once we looked at what those costs could be or what design of that could be, and we would share our findings with you and then seek your direction on how you'd like us to move forward with that. So the recommendation is that the city council provide input on the following actions and direct staff to return to the city council for final approval. So um, you noticed and was mentioned uh, in the uh, spring financial workshop, uh, you saw that we um, asked to put the gate access, the lighting and the helipad into the budget. Um, and we said we would, you know, come back. Uh, we, it's easier to pull it out than to stick it in. So we, we did it. And because the timing was a little weird, so you saw that before we got to give you this report. Um, so I do want to say that that's there. Um, to scope and complete the security measures, which is the camera, um, and then also some of the public spaces, which is to look at that observation area, and that would be in fiscal year 24. And then in fiscal year 24 and 25, design, scope, and complete the aesthetic improvements. And then as an ongoing effort, explore aviation-related community event opportunities and report back to the council. So one of the key things that is both in the lease and is an interest of the Army Corps of Engineers is that anything that we do at the airport as a as a big kind of special event tie back in to, to aviation. But we can further assess that as we move forward. So that really is, this is really the time for your questions and I really appreciate your attention to the report and um, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you, Dr. Turner. Can we go back to that last slide just so I think we can use it all, all of us could use it for reference. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Council Member Casillas. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, is there enough traditional, de enough demand for the traditional use of hangers? I didn't know that it was so popular. I was on and now I turn myself off. So. <laughs> uh, yes, the demand for hangers is huge. Really? We have a waiting list. I, I cannot tell you how many times I get called for hangers. Hangers are really in a hot commodity. We, you know, and I think also um, people really now as we're inspecting and, you know, noticing our master leaseholders that we're inspecting, we're making sure that those hangers are being used for aviation. Um, and so, um, yes, I mean, people would love to have hang full hangers and half hangers. We have more demand than we have supply. I didn't know. I didn't know it was that uh, bustling of a 
of an activity. Um, I also, I, I see that the proposal will pay for itself. And I knew that the airport paid for itself, but I didn't think that there was enough funds generated for something like this. Um, how well does the airport do? The airport revenue is estimated at roughly $425,000 a year. That's over the cost. That's, that, that's the revenue. Okay. The reason why we propose this in a phased manner is, is for that reason. We wouldn't be able to afford this entire proposal in one year, but we would be able to afford it if we phased it out in the next two, three, four years. We also have some staff time that gets paid out of that, that revenue that's generated, but it is an enterprise fund. Therefore, the monies that are generated are to be put back for those purposes. Out of curiosity, so the revenue is about 425. Do you know the expenses? The expenses right now far lower than what the actual revenue is. Um, I, if I, I'd have to, if I'd have to guess, our expenses about half, about a quarter. Oh yeah, I would say half about to half. half to a quarter. Yeah. Now I'm not, I'm not taking into consideration staff time because, mm -hmm. quite honestly, I don't know how much of my time right now is charged to it, but. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is that we have some grants. Okay. A lot of a lot of COVID pandemic grants, and I charge my time to that every single week. So right now, every penny that's earned is just getting accumulated into that fund balance, while my time is being charged to these. That's and good. It's an eligible cost mm -hmm. to these grants that we've received. Mm -hmm. It'll help then to um, for these future capital investments. And we can confirm that for you, Council Member. Make Thank sure you. you the right number. Thank yeah, you. I, I just I want to I just want to get a, a rough idea of what that differences. Um, see if this is a gangbusters, or if this is a real, you know, um, uh, revenue generating uh, thing for us, or if it's, you know, so-so. Um, and then the last thing, it's more of a comment. I love the idea of, you know, down the line exploring the possibility of having an event space. Um, whenever that time comes to fruition, I just think we, we really need to think very critically about parking. However large the event space is, where is everyone going to park? Um, and, you know, maybe we can use the space uh, if it's after hours or what have you. But uh, just a, a little note to think about that. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. And I think we're looking at it in conjunction with I, th I don't think we could do anything sort of independently at the airport. I think we would have to think about that in conjunction with the use of Butterfield Park. Okay. So we would do something that was integrated between the two spaces. Um, uh, so, I mean, at least that's where our thinking is today. As we investigate it further, we may learn or do something different. But that's where, that's where we are today. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the presentation. I'm, I'm in agreement with the recommendations, and I think it's just a very thoughtful approach um, to addressing, you know, this reinvestment in the area. It's not all, all at once. It's not. It feels, it feels doable. So thank you. Councilman Richens. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it's a great presentation. Um, I, I have one question and a couple comments, and the question's just out of my ignorance. The the need for a helipad, is there a need for a helipad or is it just like like helicopters lining up or I, I just I just don't know. So we do have a tenant of one of our master leaseholders that regularly has helicopters and regularly uses them. And so now we have some agreement with that master leaseholder of the way that those helicopters have to to come into the airport and 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 use the space that we have. So there would be a need. It's not that helicopters are lining up to to use the helipad, but it is we do have that use at the airport. And so to have that helipad that was started but not completed, um, fully completed and sanctioned by the FAA, we think is important. We think that that, you know, why have an asset if it's not fully you know, utilized. Cool. Thank you. And I, I used to take my kids there to watch airplanes land, and I still go there and watch airplanes land. The, uh, I think the lighting upgrades will pay for themselves because you'll switch over to LED lights, so that's a no-brainer. Um, 
I think the observation area is genius. It, it'll be really cool, and it'll it'll just be for the community. So they win there. I like the idea of a mud run, as long as I don't have to run. I, I like the idea of mud. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and just two suggestions, and you guys can take them for what it's worth and play with it or not play with it. Butterfield Road used to be the uh, that's that's where the train tracks were. The original train tracks was Butterfield Road, and then they had to reroute around Prado Dam, so the train tracks became Butterfield Road. So if there's any way to highlight that in your observation area, just so people could see it, and then um, as far as I know, it's always just been the Corona Airport, but maybe explore the ideas of naming the airport after someone like. Uh, Admiral Flagg, who was a jet fighter in the Navy, right? So Admiral Flagg was a jet fighter in the Navy, but he died in 9-11. His plane hit the hit Pentagon. So it might be worth exploring naming the airport after a position of person of prominence. So just play with those ideas. And that's it for me. Thanks. Okay, thank oh, and I'm full favor of all the options. Councilor Casillas, she had a follow-up. Yes, I forgot to ask about the, the helicopter question. Is it currently being used? Are helicopters currently at the airport? And if they are not, does that then raise a question about noise? And I bring that up because I received a very angry phone call from a gentleman. That I can't remember when it was. Um, it was. It was. It was an awful call, and he was very upset about the helicopters. There's nothing I can do to control it, but I would imagine that the neighbors in the area might have some concerns if that becomes the primary use of the airport. So it wouldn't ever become the primary use of the airport. The primary use of the airport is for aviation for planes and, and the use of the runway. Um, we do have helicopters now. Again, they're associated with one particular business, which is a tenant of one of our master leaseholders. Um, so we wouldn't expect anything that is, we wouldn't expect anything to be different than what is happening now it is really about ensuring that an asset that belongs, you know, this, this helipad asset is certified by the FAA and that it's, it, it is fully, can be fully used so that they don't have to hover into land, that they can just come down and land on the helipad. The challenge and, and probably the noise as well is that hovering as they get to the pad to land. Uh, and so we want to make sure that, that, that's, that that's not happening. We want to make sure that it's, <clears throat> it's appropriate. And I did want to follow up on your, your last question about the differentiation. We, are, we have a net gain each year of $300,000 at the airport. So mm -hmm. we bring in about half a million dollars in revenue. We expend about $200,000. And so we do have some monies there. Um, and we'd like to make sure that those... And we've, and we've been very fortunate to get some of these COVID grants. They just, they, they've come down through the FAA. They've, we've been able to secure those. And so we would like to make sure that we're m pushing that money back into the airport. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great. Uh, uh, thank could, you. Yeah. Can I, I add I, just a little bit more uh, sure. to, to the airport uh, response? Even if the helipad wasn't to be built to current specifications, helicopters are still allowed to land on the runway. So it wouldn't prevent helicopter use, as Ann said. It's not to enhance necessarily, not to increase it, it, it but it's still a, an allowed aviation purpose use. So whether we have the pad or not, they, they still are allowed to land. I mean, helicopters have been landing at the airport. I mean, I, I took a $99 flight when I was in high school with, was, we used to have Heiser helicopters had their training facility here until they moved to Riverside because frankly, the city wasn't interested in keeping them here to, in order to improve, so they ended up moving over to Flay Bob. So, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Very excited. Thank you very much, Dr. Turner. You and I have had many conversations about the airport, something very near and dear to my heart. I'm probably one of those people that shouldn't be allowed to be driving around the airport as much as I am because I'm there at least once a week, that's for sure. Um, just a couple Follow-up questions. Um, you had said in the in the presentation that potentially one of the master lease holders was looking to um, assign parcel four and five. That would leave them with parcel three. 
Are we, so we would potentially have four master leaseholders? Okay. I'm also very excited about the, um, the removal of derelict planes. There's a lot of planes that have become one with nature on the tarmac out there, and they really do need to go. Some of them still have doors that are open. Very excited to see that. I know that the new leaseholder has done a lot of work at the airport. They've done a lot of painting, a lot of updating, a lot of restriping. They're working on getting the, I think it's jet fuel tank going. Um, so I'm very excited about that. I had a question about some of the events. Um, there's currently already public spaces there or, or large spaces um, that could be used for events and have been in the past. Um, we're not creating a new space. We're just kind of redefining an existing space. Is that a better phrasing for it? That's a much better phrasing for it. And we really need to look at how to do that well. Yep. Um, instead of sort of, we want to be really intentional about both what happens there, how does that relate back to aviation, is that the most appropriate space for it, and how do we make sure that it's fully supported um, with parking and, and safety and all of that. So that for us is a longer term discussion about um, kind of working with both staff and maybe an outside consultant to really sort of examine that. But we are definitely in the most preliminary stages of that. We have some real immediate things we want to do to the, you know, do at the airport. Um, and that's sort of one of those nice to haves, yeah. but it's not, it's not the most pressing uh, on the, on the menu right okay. now. So I, I know that I have been approached by different flight organizations that would like to host events. Is that something that could happen anytime soon? Or do you think that's something that has to happen down the line when we're maybe more prepared for it? Or I think that right now one of the things, and, and this is really the foresight of the council, is that the program coordinators in community services, we have a special events program coordinator that is that person for the city. And so we're always excited to go out with folks that are interested in doing it, walk the space, find out you know, is the space the right space? What kind of permit would we need? You know, all of that, or is there another space in the city that actually could serve their purpose better? Um, but we're always willing to give that sort of concierge level of service to anyone who's interested in doing an event in Corona and trying to help them work it through. And I can't answer that question because I don't know what event they want to do. And I, I, I don't know, we obviously, as only a leaseholder and not the owner of that property would always have to run that through the Army Corps of Engineers. So the length of time to do something at the airport is far greater than in other places in the city that the city controls. So just just speaking of that, because I want to get clarification because I know that I'll, I'll ask, are, are we prepared or have we done it in the past or recently where we've had that communication with the Army Corps as far as approval for an event? Are we, are we aware or prepared for that? So I think aware and prepared are probably two different, two different things. Um, I think we're aware that a lot of people have really great ideas about things that they want to do. No one has come to us in my tenure here, which is now a, about 18 months. No one has come to us saying, this is my proposal for an event. Um, so we are not prepared you know, I, I can't speak to sort of whether we could do that. We have not had conversations with the Army Corps of Engineers um, about that because we haven't had any kind of proposal for an event. So the first one's going to be a nightmare, but after that we'll be good. <laughs> I'm excited uh, because there have been some great ideas that have been proposed to me, and and now that um, now that we're a little bit farther along, I think that we can at least direct them to the to the um, events staff and kind of go from there. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I, I'm 100% in support of, of all of the um, uh, options here. I, I'm excited for that airport. I know that we've had conversations about trying to uh, work with uh, Congressman Calvert about extending the lease, which would be great. It would also bolster more in, um, investment into the airport. So that's all good things as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the one statement that I keep getting over and over and over again is that little airports feed big airports, and they're so very important, and we're very lucky to have one in our community. And uh, the only only other 
comment that I have is about the observation area, the proposed observation area. I'm wondering, can we observe enough? I mean, it's at the end of the runway, depending on which way approach and takeoff is. Uh, you may only get the airport coming, the airplane coming down, and that it will- Lands to the west, takes No, they, they, they change. Well, it depends on the time of the yeah, day. Yeah, but you may either get the, the last part of it or the first part of it, so just food for thought. But other than that, thank you very much. Very appreciative of the hard work that you guys did here. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of follow-up questions. I think my colleagues hit a lot of the items. You mentioned this is an enterprise fund, and I, I've kind of always kept an eye on this this um, fund or this this balance over the years because it was one of those questions that people would ask me. Well, we have an airport. You know, does it make any? You know, how much does that cost? And I think one of the first things on council I found, I think the average was like two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars to two hundred fifty thousand dollars net positive every single year. So does that mean that money has been is is sitting in that fund and can be used? So what do you know what the the fund balance of that that is right now? Um, I would have to get that for you, Mayor. I don't want to guess here. Um, Sounds like it's probably over a million. It's it's not yet a million, but I I can tell you it's somewhere like eight hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred. Okay. Something around there, but I think that you... you yeah, I'm not going to hold you to it, but... And I would say, too, that, you know, as we're negotiating the, you know, as the, the, the leases are changing hands and we're having an opportunity to look at those leases, we're making sure that, um, you know, all of those leases are are reasonable and at, you know, sort of, we're not locking ourselves into, um, you know, leases that are not in the benefit of this of the city, so you know, I would expect that we could see this revenue because our major revenue, obviously, is from the the main master leaseholders. Sure, um, great. Okay, I just wanted to verify that. Secondly, I, I think that the the gate and access um, and moving it is insanely important. I can tell you just from being at the airport a lot um, over my lifetime here, it's not welcoming place. It's the, you, you go there and it basically says, you know, don't come in here. So unless you knew there was a restaurant, knew there was a place to go and have breakfast, you, you, you didn't go there. So it was kind of hidden gem and, and it's, um, you know, moving that gate back and making it more welcoming and, and introducing, you know, some, some of that, those uh, monument entry. I almost want to see if there was a way we could move up the entry and monument sign, uh, the improvements to the entry there up a little bit more, just so we could capitalize on the fact that if we do move that security gate back, that we make it more welcoming for people to come in. I know that we still haven't done places for people to go, but at least it'll allow it to look at, look like it's more open to the public. Um, lighting, I agree with, with Council Member uh, Richens. I think that's, that's, that's a good idea. The helipad, um, helicopters have been landing there, there for, for years and years. Um, like I said earlier, I, I flew a helicopter a couple times out of there. You could, you know, get those little introductory things where you're paying a hundred bucks and you got to fly out and fly around a little bit and come back. Um, and those schools did very, very well there. And I think that, that when Heiser helicopters left and went to Flay Bob sometime, I think in the early nineties, that it changed the character of the airport. So there used to be, I think, two flight schools and two or two regular fixed wing flight schools and one um, rotary wing. I think we're, there's two schools there, two schools there now, so that's good. But I, it was good to always see, you always saw a lot of activity there. Um, I think the security stuff is good. I just have questions about making sure that when we do move that security gate back that, that you know, the security will keep folks off the, because people will, drive around. I mean, I've driven through there to go to, you know, to visit a hangar. I had a, a friend of mine that had a hangar there. And, you know, if you didn't know where you're going, you'd end up on the runway pretty quickly and go, wait, I'm in the wrong place. And then trying to, to turn around and it was a little difficult. So I, I love the idea of the observation area. I agree with um, Council Member, or I'm sorry, with Vice Mayor Daddario that there's um, some opportunities there. Um, uh, but I will say, you, if you want to talk to the folks that organize the, win, the wings and wheels, they're the people who currently run um, uh, the Heritage Park. Um, they ran that program. It was completely run by an outside group. Um, it was in congregation with somebody that was had a, was a master leaseholder or was a leaseholder at one point, with uh, a couple of car clubs. 
the city really didn't run the program, and I would prefer that. I don't want us to, to have it be, it'd be nice for us to be a sponsor, us to participate, um, you know, in all the ways that we do, but I don't want us, the, the city to dictate, because I think, you know, if we have aviation folks that have an idea for a program, they know what their market is, um, they know how to attract people, and if we can find a way to, to adopt it, to have, you know, folks from the public come out and, and visit and have a place to go. And, and if, I, if I remember right, those events, they would have cars park right on the, um, in that that uh, parcel one, or the very the one in the very big, the, where all the derelict planes are, people would, would park there. Um, and it was great, thousands of people would come out, park across the street and walk over, and it was it was really a, a great time. Um, yeah, I, I love the idea. I, I, you know, I know that that staff time is is important or is is limited. So getting all these things done at the same time is is going to be difficult. But I'd sure like to see, like I said, a couple of if uh, had them make sense to to move them up if if possible. But overall, a great idea. Thank you and great for the for the presentation. Um, let's see, Miss Edwards, did we have any speaker cards? Mayor, yes, I do. I have two speaker cards for the item. Great, thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon again. So my dad used to take us down there. We used to live on that side, and we used to go hang out down there. I remember when the, the runway was on the other side. The runway was where the uh, helipad is now. Um, on the helipad need, um, you know, I mean, it, it is a real need. Um, just a couple of years ago, we had a helicopter crash near the fueling station trying to fuel up. I mean, so if you're going to have helicopters, you really need a support them because they have very different needs than, a, than an airplane. So, I mean, even to fuel the thing is a, kind of a logistical nightmare. They've got to haul fuel or come over near the fuel, and that's how the, that's how the one crashed when I clipped the, uh, the board or the overhead from the fueling. Um, so as far as the demand for hangers, um, I mean, I'll say as somebody who had a hanger down there for 10, 11 years, um, it ebbs and flows. So it, it, it's, you know... There's times when the master leaseholders, you know, all of a sudden feel like they can just charge whatever they want and jack up the rents and do whatever they want to do. And there, there's times when they're like, oh, you'll pay us some money for it? You know, they'll, they'll fire sale them. So it comes and goes. It's it, over the last, you know, decade or so, it's gone from, you know, really cheap to less cheap, but it's still half the price out here than it is in Orange County. So, I mean, a, a hangar you know, just the other side of the canyon can be a thousand, twelve hundred bucks. So um, this isn't a particularly well-regarded airport. I think the main claim to fame, from what I hear from from pilots and people that in the in the businesses, we have cheap gas here. So it's it's cheap. The hangars are fairly cheap. Um, I don't think we have to be the low rent airport. You know, we can be a really nice airport. I think that moving the gate makes all the sense in the world. And may I say. I cannot say enough how thrilled I am that you guys are in charge of the airport. So, you know, that it's not the stepchild anymore. It's not just getting ignored. It's not just, you know, uh, you know, that we deal with it when we have to deal with it. So I, I just want to say that up front too, right? Even though that wasn't up front. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, let's see, do, 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 do. The, the public spaces in the front would be great. I'm sure the cafe would love to be able to open past dark and have dinner. You know, I mean, you know, pretty much their breakfast and lunch place and they've got to go because the gate closes. So, you know, to open it up and make it a more welcoming place and make it available for people to participate and, you know, back kind of like it used to be. I don't recall that there was necessarily that much security before, but, you know, um, really honestly and get rid of the derelict airplanes and, and the other thing I would say that's just of vital importance is to have some direct communication between the city and the tenants, because I can tell you there are all manner of games that happen between the city, what the city says, and then what the leaseholders tell the tenants, and it's not always the same thing. So they don't know why. They only know why the master leaseholders say the city is coming and what the city wants and what the city expectation is. And there's times when the, uh, the tenants... You know, they're like, hey, well, you got a pulse and a checkbook? Come on down. And then there's other times where you're like, nope, you have to have, a, you have, to have an airplane in here. You know, and, and you're caught in between. You know, you're caught in between what...
Mr. Fuller. Howdy, everybody. Don Fuller. I'm a resident here in town. Uh, I'm all in favor of all of this. It sounds great. As a little bit of background, I can tell you that my father was an aircraft engineer. He worked at the Douglas plant in Santa Monica during World War II. And in the 50s and 60s, he was an engineer at Aero Commander. And, uh, and uh, it was kind of a s small company back in those days. And, and uh, he would sometimes go into the plant on Saturday, and there'd be nobody else there. And he'd take me with him. And uh, he'd be in the engineering office working on something, and I would have full free reign of the factory. And I was a 10-year-old kid running around the factory, nobody there, climbing in and out of partially built airplanes. They probably don't let people do that anymore. Uh, so it was a great time for me. And uh, a few years ago, uh, there was an aero commander on that eastern parking area at the airport. It was there for quite a while, and, I, and it was not flyable when I saw it. But one time, I wanted to take my grandkids out there and show it to them and show them some of the stuff that my dad, their great-granddad, had worked on and done. And we just walked out there and walked around airplanes. And there was no fence, no nothing. And we just walked around and poked around airplanes. And uh, we could have walked out onto the runway. And uh, it was kind of cool for me and my grandkids, but I thought it was a little bit weird. So I'm glad that there's going to be some uh, appropriate security. And as for that uh, turf dirt area out at the east end that you've outlined as possible for some use by citizens and stuff, would it be possible to plant some trees out there and put in some picnic tables and stuff so folks could come out there and spread some fried chicken on the table and watch airplanes. That wouldn't cost too much, would it? We could count that as part of the tree planting program in town as well. So uh, I'm all for this. Sounds great. Take your kids out and have them look at airplanes for a while. So uh, you all take care. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, I think direction was... Pretty clear, Mr. Ellis? Good, okay, thank you very much. You. All right, so we are going to move on to our final item, which is a code of ethics and conduct for elected and appointed officials. Uh, Donna Finch, assistant to the city manager, will please present the report. Yes, thank good you. afternoon, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Speak and members of the city council. I am here today to present a proposed code of ethics and conduct for appointed and elected officials. Um, the development of this code was prepared in response to a future agenda item submitted by Mayor Speak back in December um, of last year. So I am happy to finally bring forward staff's recommendations today for your review and consideration. So um, the items that I'm gonna be presenting today um, in this presentation is first and foremost, what exactly is a code of conduct? Um, secondly, why is it important for a, a government agency to have a code of conduct? Um, third, what our current code of ethics says in respect to code of conduct? Uh, fourth, what staff's recommendations are um, based off of our research of best practices of local government agencies on what should be in a proposed um, code of conduct? And then lastly, um, staff recommendation um, for next steps moving forward. Um, so before I get into the presentation, I just want to note that our ask of council today is that they review and provide input on the proposed code of ethics and conduct and direct staff to bring this policy back to the city council for a final approval at a future meeting. So what is a code of conduct? Um, essentially, a code of conduct is a policy that outlines roles um, and expectations for behavior in an organization. Um, these codes of conduct can exist in both um, public and private organizations. For cities, these rules are generally put in place by the elected leadership, and they outline how officials should conduct themselves both in public settings and in private encounters. Codes of conduct are also recommended as best practices by the Institute of Local Government for promoting a civil and effective governing body. So why is it important to have a code of conduct? Um, first, a, having a code of conduct is um, something that would help ensure public trust in government. And a recent study by the Pew Research Center um, back in 2021 noted that only about one quarter of Americans say that they can trust governments to do what is right. 
Now, most of this sentiment is generally directed at the federal government, but this opinion has started to trickle down to local government levels, and this has intensified since the pandemic. Um, one factor to help build public trust is for public officials to lead by example. Um, especially in this time of technology and di digital media, officials are constantly in the spotlight and the expectations by the public is that officials conduct themselves with the highest levels of ethics, civility, and decorum. Um, also having clear protocols for governance and civility helps ensure that everyone understands the types of behaviors that the public expects of them and avoids any misunderstandings. Um, a formal policy also allows officials to hold themselves and their colleagues accountable for their behaviors, and it helps set the standard for what um, is acceptable behavior within an organization and promotes a culture of civility and respect that hopefully others will follow. So um, I have a few examples of headlines that show what can happen in a public agency if it does not have a thorough code of conduct or if the conduct is not un understood or followed by city officials. Um, first is for the city of Two Harbors. We see a headline here that the mayor is facing recall due to his behavior. Uh, next headline is the city of Delano um, stating that inappropriate conduct is dividing the city council. Next is city of Santa Clara um, stating that employees are leaving the city because of unacceptable behavior by the city council. Uh, city of Norwalk, infighting amongst the council is hurting the city's relationships with um, their local school district. Next, City of Richmond, um, the city is in turmoil and officials are leaving the city and the mayor is facing censorship. And then our last headline here is the City of Westminster, um, which is another example of censorship, um, this time of both the mayor and the vice mayor by the city council. So now we know this is not the city of Corona and we don't ever want this to be the city of Corona. So um, what we're proposing today is a preventative measure um, that ha having a well-defined code of conduct is approved and followed by the city's leadership and will prevent us from ever becoming one of these headlines. So currently the city has a code of ethics in place that um, slightly addresses code of conduct very briefly. Um, this code of ethics is, is included in the um, Corona Municipal Code, Chapter 2.09, and it establishes guidelines for ethical standards of conduct for city officials. Um, this current code of ethics was established in 2007 by the city council um, through a resolution, and it applies to elected and appointed city officials, including city council members, the city treasurer, and individuals appointed to city boards, commissions, and committees. The original Code of Ethics was a fairly brief account of goals and objectives for the city, and it included um, very general principles and guidelines for conduct and professionalism, um, such as respect of individuals, honor the public's trust, and maintain open and honest communication. Um, back in May of 2011, the City Council voted to repeal that resolution for the original Code of Ethics, and they replaced it with an ordinance with a lot of the same language. However, they made it an ordinance to help codify this Code of Ethics within the City, of, city Municipal Code. So um, in response to the mayor's request to develop a code of conduct policy, staff researched the best practices for codes of conduct that are identified by both the Institute of Local Government and um, we researched some common themes within codes of conduct of other local government agencies. And based on this research, staff is recommending um, just some minor edits to our code of ethics section. The code of ethics that we have now is fairly comprehensive and we're not recommending very many changes to that at all. And um, you did see our recommendations for those changes in the red line version of the code of ethics. Um, but the majority of the changes that we are recommended is in the um, code of conduct section. So um, we are re recommending a full replacement of that section within the code of e ethics that is titled proper conduct and professionalism. And we recommend replacing that with an expanded administrative policy that speaks to best practices for code of conduct in specific situations that officials can encounter. And that includes situations um, where they are conducting themselves with each other. Um, conduct with city staff, with the public, with other public agencies, with boards and commissions, and conduct with the media. Um, the administrative policy will be cross-referenced within the municipal code and that code of ethics section. And having this um, live in an administrative policy instead of in the municipal code just allows for greater flexibility um, for the code of conduct to be more of a livable, breathable document that can be um, adapted um, easier than having to go and amend the municipal code if any changes want to be made. 
So um, before I get into our recommendations for the specific sections of the Code of Conduct Policy, um, I do want to note, again, that these are recommendations of staff, and they're based off of our research of um, local government best practices. Um, <clears throat> these recommendations are being presented for your consideration and your discussion today. We welcome any input that you have on any changes that you would like to see made, um, anything you want to be add you want to be added or anything that you want to be deleted. So we are expecting a, a active discussion on this today. So um, first section is code of conduct with each other. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we've broken this down into two sections, um, conduct with each other in public meetings as well as um, conduct with each other in private encounters. At public meetings, it is recommended that officials should refer to each other using formal titles such as mayor, vice, ma vice mayor, and council member, um, that they should practice civility and decorum in discussions and debate and avoid any disrespectful or disparaging comments, um, and that they re should respect the role of the presiding officer in maintaining order during the meeting. In private encounters, it is expected that this same respectful behaviors will continue as they would in any public meetings, and that officials should be mindful that any private notes, voicemails, or emails could be made public, so to please treat these items as potentially public communications. Um, the next section addresses city officials' conduct with staff, and similar to guidelines on officials' interactions with each other, um, we are recommending that officials maintain the same professional and respectful behavior with city staff. Um, that any questions or requests for additional information from staff should be directed to the city manager who will determine the appropriate department or individual to fulfill those requests. And other guidelines within this section include um, avoiding any disruptions to staff during their daily job functions, never publicly criticizing an individual staff member, avoiding attempts to influence staff's recommendations in administrative functions such as the hiring of staff, awarding of contracts, and granting of city licenses and permits, um, inquiring with staff before corresponding on operational issues just to prevent any conflicting statements or duplications in work, limiting requests for additional staff support beyond what is typically provided and make any requests to the city manager, and to avoid any type of solicitation of political support from staff. Um, next section deals with conduct with the public, and again, this is also broken down into conduct in public meetings as well as in unofficial settings. In public meetings, it is recommended that officials ensure that they are welcoming and actively listen to the various opinions from all members of the public, that they be fair and equitable in allocating public comment time to each speaker, that they maintain an open mind about issues for, of consideration and avoid sharing opinions until after public comment is received, um, ask for clarification on issues but avoid debating or arguing with speakers, and of course refraining from any kind of personal attacks on a speaker. And then in unofficial settings, um, which include social media, officials should not promise any action on behalf of the city council on any issue, avoid making any personal comments about other city officials, and remember to exhibit professional conduct and civility because the public is always watching. Okay, next section um, is conduct with other public agencies. Um, so when representing the city with another public agency, um, it is recommended that um, officials are clear to support and advocate the official city position on an issue and that any written correspondence should al also be equally clear of this, um, that they're representing the official city position. Um, city letterhead should only be used to represent the official city position and that um, personal stationery reflecting an individual's elected or appointed office um, is allowed for correspondence representing a personal point of view. Um, and then lastly in this section, to remember to be professional and respectful when interacting with the other public officials and show them the, the same respect that you would of any officials within your own organization. Um, next section addresses the council's conduct with boards and commissions. Um, in this section, um, it is recommended that um, council members are generally discouraged from attending board or commission meetings as their participation could be viewed as influencing the process. However, there's nothing legally that would prevent um, attendance at this meeting as long as it is in accordance with the Brown Act. However, if a council member does choose to attend a board or commission meeting, um, please remember to be sensitive about how participation may affect the process and only represent your individual opinion and not the opinions of the entire council. Um, next, similar to interactions with staff, um, it is recommended that the council please try to limit contact with board members and commissioners to questions of clarification and to not lobby on behalf of a specific issue. 
to remember that boards and commissions serve the entire community and not individual council members, to be respectful of diverse opinions, and to keep political support away from public meetings and forums. And then the final section in the Code of Conduct Administrative Policy um, deals with conduct with the media. Um, in this section, it references that the mayor or the city manager are the designated spokespeople for the, for the city, and all high-profile media inquiries should be directed to them. Um, and to please coordinate all media responses with the city manager to ensure that all the facts are being presented and the city is speaking with one consistent voice. Um, so the next section deals with responsibility and enforcement. Um, and we've expanded this section from the original policy just to clarify who is responsible for enforcing the code and any potential penalties for violating it. Um, each city official is generally responsible for ensuring their own understanding of the code of ethics and conduct and all guidelines and ensure that all guidelines are being followed. Um, however, as the elected leaders of the city, the mayor and the city council have an additional responsibility to intervene when violations of the code are brought to their attention. Um, if officials intentionally and repeatedly do not follow the guidelines outlined in the code, um, penalties or sanctions can include but are not limited to public reprimand or censure by the city council, loss of regional board or committee assignments, removal of board members, commissioners by the city council, or loss of appointment or removal from vice mayor or mayor position. Initial violations of the code, especially if they appear to be unintentional, can be um, pointed out to the offending official by another official. However, if the offense continues, um, it is recommended that the matter be referred to the mayor um, in private to initiate action. If no action is taken by the mayor, um, then recommendations are um, that the mayor, or if the mayor, excuse me, is the person whose actions are being challenged, then it is recommended that the violation can be brought up by any council member with the full council in a public meeting. Um, and then lastly, if a violation is outside the behaviors identified in the code, then an investigation can be referred by the full city council to the city manager for further action. Um, now for ethics and conduct training, um, staff will ensure that all city officials receive a full training on all sections of the code of ethics and conduct in their initial orientation. And we have also developed a quick reference guide with the um, key points of the sections within the code of conduct that um, are identified in the presentation today and that will be made available to all elected officials to keep for reference. Um, so with that, our recommendation again today is that the City Council re will review and provide input on the proposed Code of Ethics and Conduct and direct staff to bring this policy back to the City Council at a future meeting um, for, a final uh, for final approval. Again, we welcome your feedback and discussion on these recommendations here today and any changes you would like to see based off of um, what staff's recommendations are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Finch. That's, uh, that was a great presentation. So I'll go to Council Member Casillas. <laughs> it's okay. Everything's fine. Ms. Finch, <laughs> I just have a question. Um, um, you mentioned the difference, or you mentioned administrative code versus a municipal code. And there's flexibility in an administrative code. Could you speak a little bit more about what the pros and cons are and why we're not pursuing this as a municipal code and instead as an administrative one? Sure, and um, our city attorney may be able to help me on this a little bit. Um, it was recommended that this be put into an, an administrative code in consultation with the city attorney. Um, generally, the municipal code, to make any amendments, the process is um, a little bit more lengthy. I believe it has to come back as an ordinance for first review and then final consideration. Administrative codes have a lot more flexibility. They could be changed quicker, um, as well as the language within the administrative code. Um, a lot of the things that we are presenting today are um, more aspirational. Um, the municipal code is written very um, uh, prohibitive language, tech, like legal language, so um, that was kind of what this was based on to include it in an administrative policy. We thought it would just um, lend itself better to that, and then I'll refer to the city attorney if he wants to add to it. To yeah, Ms. Finch did a great job. Um, <laughs> yeah, the municipal code is meant to be a law that's enforced, so it's written much more uh, like a lawyer would write as opposed to um, aspirational, as she indicated. And then, plain and simply, um, 
administrative code or policy, and really maybe using code and code is what's confusing, but administrative policy is just one action to have amended. The An ordinance, something in the code, takes two readings and 30 days, so it's really two months before it becomes effective. Got it. So if you're having an aspirational thing, maybe you're gonna find that some of this isn't working or you wanna tweak it or do something, and rather than taking two months to effectuate that, it would be one evening and you'd be able to make that change. So it's just a, it's a procedural thing, but it doesn't um, weaken or what we are deciding today, these self-imposed rule, rules are not any less no. because they're an administrative policy. In fact, that's why we suggested uh, referencing in the municipal code that we have this administrative policy. So they'll cross-reference to each other so that any member of the public that finds the municipal code and reads through it will know that there's also an administrative policy that they can ask to see and get a copy of. So uh, it's it's incorporated by reference, if you want to use legal language, into the municipal code. Got it. Thank you. Um, I should have started with this. Thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, this is the first time that you're presenting to us, and that was that was really great. Um, and you clearly did a lot of work. So <laughs> thank you for checking out what uh, neighboring cities have in store. Um, this is absolutely not, we're not breaking the mold here, the city of Corona going into uh, creating a, you know, a, a code of conduct and a code of ethics. Our neighboring cities have this. Um, to different degrees of success. Um, <laughs> and I think we do a pretty good job here. We, you know, we're pretty respectful so far. Everything's been working out all right. These guys don't get out of hand too much, at least not in public. So, um, <laughs> so I think we're doing all right. <laughs> there is a code there. You have to be um, mindful of that. Um, but you know, I think this is really a good time to talk about this before any issues do arise, if they arise, because, you know, you certainly don't want to get to a place where there's concerns and then you're coming up with rules on the fly. So I think it's a good moment for us to have this conversation. And it really makes me think about, you know, um, the year I served as mayor, you know, our mayorship here, it's, it's one year. You know, and it's, uh, you know, through nominations and votes of our peers, of our colleagues. And uh, while it doesn't have any extra, you know, policy power, we don't, as mayor, we don't get to, you know, single-handedly pass any policy or change anything. We are the face of the city and we, you know, we do, people do turn to, to the mayor, um, you know, to represent the entire city and to speak uh, especially during times of turmoil. So I think it's really important for us to have these agreed rules um, ahead of time because, you know, Jim, who isn't here, and that might be on purpose. Um, oh, no, <laughs> I'm just no, joking. No, no, it's no, not, that's that. not why. I'll that's not why. I don't want to start any rumors. His daughter's in from out of the country, and they haven't seen each other for years. So um, it's a really good reason why he's not here. Um, but no, it's, you know, our mayorship isn't, it, we're not elected at large. It's a rotational thing, but it is, a, it is a, in a, a significant role. And we do have to, you know, be mindful of the fact that we are representing um, the city when we're mayor, when we're vice mayor, when we're council members. And so I think this is a really good thing. Um, and so with that, I'm just, I'm in agreement. And I don't think, you know, no one's in trouble. I don't feel like I'm in trouble. I do feel like this is a good moment, though, for us to have these honest conversations and introspection about what it is that we want to set as our ground rules. So I'm in favor of this code of conduct. I appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Richens. For the record, I feel like I'm always in trouble. <laughs> If you're in trouble with your wife, it doesn't count. I'm always in trouble with her, too. Miss <laughs> um, Finch, congratulations on the rookie report. Or, I mean, rookie first-time reporting deal. Um, as usual, Councilmember Casillas is the wise one. I, uh, I've i been hoping for a council code of conduct for some time now. and. Uh, <laughs> See, you ask and you shall receive. I'm happy to push this forward. And <laughs> guys laugh. As uh, everything you said is good. There's wisdom in all of it. And you're right. To be an, an elected official carries a, a high degree of responsibility. 
And a council person, vice mayor and mayor should live up to a higher standard. It's or they should be voted out, either or. But since you bring all this up, um, I would like to tack on to this. Is uh, This has been a concern I've had since being elected. Is uh, if you're gonna elevate your council to positions of authority and giving guidance and policy creation and so forth, then they really need to see their whole city. They need to be able to go within the city without bans. And so, uh, I think part of this is we need to explore access for city council members, access to libraries, access to police stations, access to fire stations. If there's somewhere with a card reader, you have members of a council that are in authority. Um, let's not limit that access. Let's, uh, let's make sure our council can see a full picture and, uh, and get that access. Currently, we don't have that access and it's troublesome. So since we're bringing this up in policy, uh, let's explore those avenues too. And I'm really hoping to not get a hard no on that. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have some thoughts on this. Um, I'll be honest, at first I didn't like any of this um, because I was elected to do a job and sometimes that job is not fun. Um, and I read, I actually read our Corona Municipal Code several times, and then I actually read a lot of the uh, rules and regulations that were um, referenced in it. And so there's a lot of redundancies in here. So I do have some recommendations of things that I'd like to have removed from these. Um, number one, do not disrupt staff from their job. I would like removed. Never publicly criticize a staff member. I would like removed. Um, be respectful or be professional and respectful when interacting with other officials. I would like removed. I would like, I'm not joking about that either. That's not funny. Um, no discussion. Uh, th I'd like to see uh, some expansion on um, as council members being prepared to have um, our discussions and to be prepared to make votes and to be prepared to understand what's going on. And I actually 100% agree with Council Member Richen on council access. We need 100% access. I think um, we're being asked uh, a lot here. We're being asked of a lot here. And um, it bothers me that I don't have access to everything as well. I don't, you know, uh, uh, I don't need, you could turn these things off so that I can't access like the, the women's restroom or something along those lines. But um, if there's a card reader in the city, we should have access to it. If we're gonna be held to these standards, obviously we're doing um, our job. I do agree that we need 100% access. Those are my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll circle back to those. Um, for me, I, first of all, thank you very much for, for uh, this report. I was uh, brought this forward and for one reason only. We, back in December, we voted on um, establishing rules, decorum rules for the public. And I figured it's only fair that if we have rules for the public that we wanted to outline, that it'd be an opportunity for us to, to look at what we have now and come up with rules for ourselves. Um, it's, it's important. I, and thank you for including the red line. I, I did have a couple of, of comments and I really wanted to kind of center those comments around just kind of um, a couple things. One, that you know, we, we have rights as as citizens. We are here as citizens. We we you know we're able to offer our opinions on things as a private citizen, just like anybody else. Just because we were elected, you know that's that's not limited in in, in a lot of ways. Secondly, as a council member, uh, I was elected by the folks in my district to represent them. Um, it may not be how the city feels or my colleagues feel, but I should be able to share how how I feel. Um, necessarily about a, a, a project. That's one of the items I wanted to talk about when, because it, it does in the, in the red line, there was a comment about that we uh, should, where was the actual comment here? It was in the, in the policy under uh, conduct with the public uh, 1C, which it says city, city officials should seek to maintain an open mind about issues for consideration and should refrain 
from sharing opinions or inclinations about upcoming votes until after the public comment is received. My understanding, and, and maybe um, Mr. Durlich, you could clarify that, I think that's a must, not a refrain, correct? It's a must on quasi-adjudicatory items, so things that are public hearings, things where you're applying a given set of rules to a specific situation, so a land use approval or the like. It's not a must when it comes to your legislative powers. So you're deciding whether to allow houses to be painted blue or not <laughs> throughout the whole city. You're allowed to have an opinion about that or cannabis or things like that. You're allowed to have opinions about those things. And so I think what this is doing is indicating, and we can make it more clear to say it's a must in these situations right. or the, I think what the code of ethics is, uh, or conduct is attempting to do is saying, even in those situations where you have legislative powers and can, just be cautious about when that opinion is expressed and making sure things, you know, work through the process before you do. That's why it's a should as opposed to a, a shall. Okay. I mean, and I, I asked that question not because of anything that's happened here in the city. I, in my day job, I'm, I hear or see council member or other folks that have ventured opinions about projects before they came and before them. And, and you're remembering the orientations where I spent a lot of time <laughs> saying, don't go out and and give your opinion about quasi adjudicated well I, things ahead negative of time. negative opinion it's a difference right or positive no you could say okay. I love I don't care what that pro I don't care how many houses I love that developer and I'm going to vote for that project okay if you say that in advance of the public hearing then you're biased pro it can't be biased either way okay. if it's a quasi adjudicative Great. hearing you have to be neutral and wait for the hearing to come to you. And so I, I harp on that a lot. So I think you're remembering that, and that's why you. I, I try to remember shot. some things, but I, I appreciate that. Okay, good. I wanted to make sure I, I got that right. Um, and then and under the same thing under D uh, one, uh, be clear about representing the the city and, and personal interests. I, I think, you know, that goes back to my original point, which I th I think we should be able to share our opinions as council members. Um, and I'll give an example. I, I, I uh, went to Riverside County um, Planning Commission and spoke out against um, a cannabis facility that was, that was near, wasn't in the city, it was outside of the city. And I thought it would be detrimental um, to the city uh, and its, its uh, location. And I spoke, in fact, the, the chair asked, he said, are you speaking on behalf of the city? And I said, I am not, I am speaking on as, as my position as the elected official for that district. And I wanna make sure that, that this policy wouldn't preclude anything like that. Okay, good. Um, because it's similar to like, you know, when we can write a letter on city letterhead as opposed to on our own personal letterhead, like council member from district one. So that seems very consistent. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure because there, there's some language there that, that it's not, it's a little bit squishier and, and I wanna make sure that, that we're clear. To that point, Mayor, if I can. Um, that's Great. this particular section. I think we can tighten up the language just a little bit. It, it does clearly allow for you to go out in your own personal capacity and do that, but I think there's a little bit of tweaking we could do just okay. to make that less confusing. Thanks for bringing it up. Perfect. Um, I think and also in the, the next section, D2, I, I, I agree as well. Uh, I think it's the same, the same comment. Um, and then under uh, conduct the media, I think that the whole high profile media inqu inquiries, yeah, I, I think that there's some, you know, duh items. Um, but at the same time, I, the way that I read it without any, I don't know how you define that, but you know, when I, I was asked by Press Enterprise to give a, an interview about um, you know, a, a road or an off-ramp or something, I, I, I don't feel it'd be appropriate for me to reach out, and no offense, Jacob, but I think I know a little bit more about off-ramps than, than you do, but, um, but I felt like I, I would be um, okay in that respect to, to offer an opinion. I don't, I don't wanna have to, have to come and get called into, into uh, uh, discussions with my colleagues because I spoke to the press or gave an interview about about something that I have uh, expertise at. 
Can I, Mayor, can I comment on that? Sure. Um, first point, I guarantee you know more about on-ramps, off-ramps, <laughs> or any ramps than I do. Um, no, the intent here is just to make sure that we're all using the same information and that we're speaking with one voice. It's not asking per, per, for permission. Right. So it's not as though you need to come and say, am I allowed to? It's more so coming and saying, hey, do I have all the picture here? Is there other information about this, this ramp that I'm not hearing about? Typically, when newspapers are calling for a story, there's a story. And right. We simply want to make sure that you have all of the facts before you go out. So it's, it's not so much about permission as it is coordination. Okay, great. I just want to make sure. Um, and then... In, let's see, under A, under the uh, Code of Ethics uh, and Conduct for Elected Officials, uh, Section 2.0904, we in, import, import the language that says, even in appearance, uh, conflict of interest in addition to not violating applicable state and federal law in order to ensure a dependence and impartiality on behalf of the common good and, and encourage compliance with the conflict of interest laws, city officials shall not, or shall use their best efforts to refrain from creating even the appearance of, of impropriety. I just, it's, it's a bit squishy for me. Um, in appearance, because uh, in appearance to me, in appearance to, to somebody in public, or you know, my mom, um, or my grandmother, God bless her soul, uh, would would have a different opinion on lots of things. So I, I'm, I, I don't like that. Those words, I think that that it there it creates, I think, a, an opportunity for, um, I'm foreseeing, you know, two folks that may be, be in conflict with each other and use this as a way to poke the other person. Um, Ms. Finch, you mind if I jump in? Today? Thank you. So the one thing that I want to make sure we're careful about is we're not attempting to expand the universe of conflict laws, right? There's hundreds of pages of regulations on the FPPC and what is or is not a conflict. So I don't, I, I want to make clear that we're not trying to add to that. And so that's why we said, look, your obligation is to comply with the state conflict laws. But in addition to that, here's something. And so it's not in, it's not intended to be um, mandatory. It is intended to be uh, and sort of an I mean, affirmation, I'm, I'm, aspirational thing. Sure. And I, I can see what you mean by it being squishy. And so we're open to some comments and what you feel comfortable. Yet this is another reason why we think it's good to have these things in administrative policy so that, because we're going we're gonna to learn about this language and you're going to want to adjust it from time to time. And, the, and this is one of those situations where... A, open to, to language that you might feel more comfortable I, I, with. And the only reason I mention that is just because, and again, we're doing this at a time where there isn't an issue. So it, it, it's not being used as a, as a poker. And I could see this being, I feel that there's an appearance of, you know, whatever, and it could be used to, you know, create tor turmoil. And I, I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure. And, and I think, frankly, there's so many things that are filled, uh, so many decisions that are filled with, because this happened, this happened. I want this to be kind of more pure that we're really looking at ways to, to limit what our, um, what our exposure would be. And, and one of the things that I've been, I've tried to do, uh, and, and maybe uh, I've erred on the side of, even in the, in the appearance, is that whenever I've had an issue where I thought it was an issue, I've asked, for the city attorney's office to ask, ask the FPCC saying, hey, can you get a formal response back? Because you know, I have lots of conflicts with my business and or, you know, with the company I work for and, and saying, hey, can you ask them? So maybe if there's some language in there that we can put in about sure. FPCC, basically if you have a potential conflict that you, you ask, you talk, you request. And if I can put this issue in some context too, because I've heard this over many years, some people will say, "Look, I don't want to. I don't want to participate in something that even looks like I might have a conflict of interest no, I because feel the same way. I because there's an an appearance of a conflict." Others will say, "I'm elected to do a job, and therefore, if I don't have a conflict under the law specifically, regardless of the appearance, I'm going to vote because I can." It's not, I don't have a conflict, and regardless of what the appearance is, I'm still gonna vote. Those are two different 
perfectly acceptable positions to take as a council member. And this language, we know that we're trying to thread that line so that both of those opinions can be accommodated and feel comfortable. So I mean, I, I've, this is this is a difficult sentence. To, yes, to and, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up because I mean, even you know, frankly, before I was elected, I I said, look, I see a lot of potential for a conflict, and I sat down with with you and and said, okay, so here's the situations. What if it was this? What if it was this? And I I was very I think I had a pretty good understanding of it. Um, but even when we've had things that came up that that met my understanding, I still asked and still wanted to get the response because I wanted to make sure if it came back from the public or from anyone else, you could hand over something saying the FPCC says this is great, Bending, you know, based on the on the information that I provided. So, um, okay, so that's that's me in the weeds a little bit. Um, I think the rest are, are fine. I didn't have any other issues. Um, I think before we come back and talk about the the, the several things that that uh, my colleagues had mentioned, maybe we'll go to the to the public and if they have any comments. I see we have one person. Probably won't be surprised that I have a couple things to say on this. Um, to Mr. Daddario's point, um, I think the problem lies in that, you know, look, I love all you guys. We're all good, but sometimes you think that. There's your little individual junior city managers. You don't run the place. It's not your city to run. It's his city to run. You guys are an oversight board. You know, it's, it's your job to provide direction to this guy and to get advice from this guy. You don't have to take the advice from this guy. He's an advisor. He's your employee. And, and I think it also does you a disservice to refer to these fine people that are usually sitting at these tables as staff or your staff, they're not your staff. They're city employees. They're his staff. You know, you don't go in a, into, into uh, uh, Walmart and refer to the people that work at Walmart as your employees. They're not your employees. <laughs> they're your employees. So you can hire and fire these guys, but that's it. And so, you know, I, I think that's part of the conflict. And to your point, and I support what you're talking about, you, the people in particular at, at these desks, and nice, nice way to jump in the deep end. <laughs> Good job. Um, so, uh, you know, the people that sit at these tables, I think, uh, you know, look, I've always had a different attitude. The people, by the time you get to this point, you have a lot of zeros in your paycheck. You, you have thick skin. You, you fought and clawed and earned your way up to this table. You know, you should be allowed to criticize the people at these tables. You're an oversight board. And it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult line to walk with not being personal, you know, but it's sometimes you got to call a spade a spade. And so I, I, I mean, I think you're right. I think you're right, you know, to, to say, well, you can't criticize. Look, you should not be going after rank and file employees because something is not their job. It's not their, you, this is not your place. But if you see something that a department head does or something that happens management wise, you know, you can't spend all day yelling at Mr. Ellis about it. You know, that's not going to be productive. The guys that are sitting here, they're sitting here for a reason. They're sitting up at these tables, you know, and and by and large, everybody up here that's sitting at these tables now is well qualified. And I don't see any of them catching any heat because they're all competent for the most part, you know, with a couple of exceptions. But, you know, I, maybe you just want to message something over to me and let me do it. You know, I don't know, you know, but I don't see a problem with you guys, you know, expressing professional criticism. Um, the other thing, um, boards and commission attendance, it always warms my heart when I see a council person showing up and taking an interest in something. I think the people that are on the boards and commissions now are very, very competent. They know what the hell they're doing, and they're not going to change the opinion because Wes, you know, is like, oh, no, no, no. If they think it's right, they're going to do what the, what's right. You know, and so, I, I mean, I... I like it when I, I, it always makes me happy when I see that. Um, the other thing is I don't see anything about the Brown Act in here. And I see you worried about a lot of things and not worried about the right things. Uh, when I see four or five council members at a public meeting discussing public policy, all nodding in agreement, it's a clear act. It's a clear violation of the act. You should not be, you know, support group for each other. Go ahead. 
Right. Um, I was just going to point out, it does address the Brown Act. Uh, chapter, uh, the Municipal Code provision does say compliance with the Brown Act is, is required, of course. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you. The reason we have codes and laws is not because most people are decent folks, but because they have uh, just a few too many corrupt jerks. And um, as an example, we used to have an individual on this council. I forgot his name. But just to, off the top of my head, I just ran down a few things that occurred while he was on the city council, if you're looking for an example of unethical behavior. The, the uh, California Fair Political Practices Commission found him in violation of state campaign finance law. I have the letter verifying that at home. And that was an action that was initiated by two citizens, not by the mayor, but by two citizens, me being one of them. There was a video in which he delivered a campaign speech, a very specific campaign speech during a church service as the guest of another preacher in town who regularly comes up here and gives invocations. And during that campaign speech, he specifically mentioned three people who are running for office. And he also lied about three citizens in Corona. Two of those people he lied about are in this room right now. And that's in violation of Internal Revenue Service Code or the Johnson Amendment. He referred to citizens in this room as cancer and malignant cells. He had an association with the homeless facility that we're working out over on Harrison Street. He got, and then that was being run by some company in Orange County. And he was making money off of that as a director or manager or something. He was repeatedly asked from this microphone what his relationship was, what his financial relationship was with that. And he refused to give any answer on that. But he was profiting from that. He was written up in a police report from the city of Orange for assault and battery against a member of his family. That happened while he was on city council. I showed that police report in the city council meeting one night. I have that at home. And at the, at, toward the end of his term, there was an award ceremony where he and a bunch of his buddies took over this place. And he was given an award by his buddies. It was an award that he invented so he could give it to himself. So if you want an example, you know, you're, that's all... Tell me I'm not telling you the truth. All that's the truth, and that's not all of it. So if you want an example of an ethical behavior, there is one, and thank goodness he's no longer here. He once told me that he was going to pray for me. I cannot repeat what I said back to him on that. So that's an example of an ethical behavior. And actions were brought not by the mayor or anybody, but by citizens who were, who were upset about it and were tired of it. So... I, I look forward to this. He was also a pastor and a Republican, for the record. So I look for, well, that's the truth. And so I look forward to this code of ethics, and I also look forward to its enforcement. And Mr. Daddario, if you want to argue with me, it's okay. We can do that. So uh, that's where I am on this. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Okay, so we had a couple of items to go back to. Um, one was um, access to uh, all areas of the city. And I, I know that the intent is that there, there are places, there's no reason for us, at least I don't think there's a reason for me to be in, in finance or, or in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the bowels of the police department or any other place. I guess um, I don't think I that having access to any one of those those buildings or rooms helps me do my job any better. But that's just my opinion, so I'm interested in hearing yours. Um, so I guess we'll take each one of them. Mayor, on the, on the point of access cards, that's really beyond the scope of a code of conduct, so I'm happy to have that conversation at another time if council wants to go down that road. Okay. This, is, this is really not an omnibus bill to fix every other problem in the city. <laughs> it's really just about conduct, so I would right. suggest that if that's Got something it. that we want to bring up. I, w I would rather it. leave it tied to this. Oh, I don't think it is. I think it's what he's it, saying. It won't come back unless it's tied to this. And then if it does come back, it's going to be a very, very slanted presentation. So I'd rather leave it tied well, to this. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll say, Councilman Richards, that, uh, that um, I think he's making a point that there that isn't in the in here, and so it's not something we can make a decision on. But I I see where you're going, and I there's two of my colleagues that expressed an interest in talking about it. So I'm perfectly... Uh, in favor of bringing that back to talk well, about? Here's the point. So you have presentations and they're polished, right? 
So if we bring this back in its own presentation, it's going to be very polished, and you're going to hear about a thousand reasons why council people shouldn't have access. And I'm done with it. So I sat through a code of conduct class, lecture, whatever you want to call it, on how I should behave, and I'm going to tie access to it because that's how I behave with access. If we're going to set a policy, then come hell or high water, I need to see what I'm setting policy for. So I know I have two. I know Steiner's not here. And I think I got a shot at Well, I, I mean, I want to explore. Well, before, before we, oh. we delve any more, I'd ask, oh. like to add, hold on. Before we, do we have any other discussion, maybe I could ask the city attorney if, if, you, if is this a, an area that we can talk about? Well, uh, you, you can talk about it. I mean, if you believe that that needs to be added to the code of conduct, okay. I think the, right. I think you can talk about it. Um, I think what the city manager is raising is a is a preference for them to be split because they are not tied together. Uh, but the fact that you uh, one or two may believe they are. Um, I think you can have that conversation. If you're asking me, yes. do you violate the Brown Act by having that conversation? I don't. That's believe. what I'm asking. I don't. I don't believe so. Okay. I think you right. can have that conversation. All right, Councilmember. I, I was just going to jump in because I think you know I, I want to understand a little bit more about um, the intent behind access because you know Mr. Morgan was spot on when he said about our form of government. We have a council management form of government. And so we have two staff members. We don't have the entire staff. So what business do I have going into the IT department? They're not my staff. So, but if the intent is, you know, there's things that would help me do my job better if I could access X, Y, and Z, then that makes a lot of sense to me. But if it's oversight over staff, that's not my that's not my role that's not my job so i'd like to understand a little bit better about where where this is going i, I can give some some background on that so I, ru I run a business right and it's my job to be successful at this business and if i don't know what's going on with my business because i don't have access to my business then i fail or i have a potential to fail so let's let's just I don't need access to the police locker room of evidence. I don't, and I'm not looking for that. And to be honest with you, if I had access to something, I, I don't even know that I would use it. But if you're going to set policy for a city, right, maybe better policy would run for a better library operating. So if I had more access to a library, I can set a better policy. I could see more. When you limit me to three card readers in a building, and that's all I have, I don't see a full picture. So if you're going to set policy at whatever government level, you have to see the full picture. It's not about going and kicking down Joanne Coletta's door and say you need to do your job better. I don't think any of us have ever expressed interest in managing personnel, but you need to be able to have the vision to see a full picture. I don't have that now. Well, I, don't, I don't think that, that, I mean, I know my card reader works, I mean, during office hours. Like I can, in fact, I had an issue getting in one of the, into to go see the city attorney and said, hey, look, my, my card reader doesn't let me go to see one of my only employees. And, and they corrected that and, and we're allowed, I'm allowed to go anywhere in any building, any building here Plus, during, during business hours, outside of business hours. I'm... It, it, it's regardless. It, you, if you're gonna sit through, a, first of all, you're elected by roughly 40,000 people in a district, right? There are 40,000 people that say, I trust this person to be elected. There is a trust there. Second of all, you, you come into this position of responsibility. Your job as one who sets policy is to set the best policy ever. Whether it's night or day, maybe you see something, maybe you don't, maybe you come here at night and walk around, I don't know. But, but you're elected as a level of trust. So, one, to limit access, first off, just publicly says, I don't trust you, right? Second is uh, don't, don't limit your policymakers. Let them see how everything's made. Let them, let them walk around. Let them see whatever it is they need to see so that you can have a higher functioning level of government. If I was to tie this request to the strategic plan, I could do so in many, many ways. 
So it's not to boss people around. It's not to play prima donna. It's not to, to govern the city. That is Jacob's job. But if I can't see the full vision, I can't see the full vision and I can't set a proper policy or be part of a team that sets a proper policy. So it's just, it's rubbed me wrong. It's rubbed me wrong since the day I was elected that I have a direct path up, a direct path down, and then you're done. I, I, I don't want to have a limited vision. I want to see a whole picture. And so, okay, so what I'm hearing is that you want to be able to experience City Hall and the services that are provided at City Hall to their greatest extent, so that to see if our processes are working well and where we can improve them. I don't even know that it's City Hall. I, I want to see my whole city thrive, okay. right? So there may, I have no access to Skyline Road, right? None of us have been issued a key whatsoever. There may be a city policy out there that we could formulate that puts Skyline, path, Skyline Road on a better segue. But I don't have access to that, so I'm limited. And you've limited your policymakers through access, and I just don't appreciate being limited. If I can convince two council members to follow, then I now have more access. And I don't mind doing it publicly either, by the way. But no, I, I, I get it. I'm, and I'm still trying to work to understand. And so, so and I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Clearly. All right. So two things. One is that um, I know, for instance, I recently um, was, um, I had a baby, right? You all know this. Before I had a baby. What? Yes, this happened. Um, before I had a baby, I was planning to have a baby shower. And you all, think gra graciously actually offered to sponsor and paid for the fees for me to have a baby shower at Circle City Center. Because of the COVID spike, we ended up making it a drive through event instead of a, an in-person event. But I experienced what it was like to sign up for this event through, you know, trying to secure, I promise this has a point, um, trying to secure a space um, at the city. And, um, and I learned through that experience all the places where I think we can improve, because the experience was not great. And the, 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 what I want to pose to you as, um, as a question is, I know that I, they know who I am that as I was applying and going through the process that I was already getting preferential treatment. You will absolutely, walking through the space, get preferential treatment and no one will behave normally because they will know your, our faces are in the building's walls. So if your intent is to get an unbiased opinion, playing devil's advocate here, you will not because you are a sitting council member. And here's the second devil's advocate argument. I trust you and I trust you wholly. What if, and we're setting these rules now, you know, ahead of something happening. What if somebody else sat in the seat? You know, we had a gentleman speak on previous members of the council. Would you want someone else to have unfettered access to everything in the city. And I can tell you that I would not. <laughs> I would not. I would not. So I pose those two questions to you because I think I understand where, where, what your concern is, but I don't know that including access, unfettered access, is the answer. Yeah, so I'll, I'll help. So devil's advocate one, um, no doubt. A city council person walks through an office, they're going to be recognized. But that that's not the point, right? Your your point is maybe I I walk by and I see something, or maybe there's something wrong. I mean, we're we're going through a whole six sigma seven process to make our city better, right? We just talked about that at the last council meeting. You can correct me on it later. But your job as a council person is to make policy for your city to be run as optimal as possible. And part of that is to hire a kick-ass city manager, which we did. But there's other things that you can do. You're, you're still trying to um, be optimal in your city council position. And it's elected by 40,000 people. There's 40,000 people in your district. Now to go to devil's advocate number two, right? You have, or we've had, thanks to Don pointing out one earlier, we've had a Sly Fox 
sitting in council. We've had some lemon mayors, right? But even if you were to give one of those guys access, they're not turning on computers and kicking trash cans over. They're not, they're, there's really not a, and if they are, I'm pretty sure it'll be noticed really quick. So these guys aren't the key holders to the checking account. They're not embezzling millions of dollars, or I hope they're not. So it, it's not really that you need to have this fear. And by the way, when you reference a city council, you don't put rules in place that just say, hey, we want to go to the lowest common denominator of a previous council person. Don't. That, that limits you. That limits you from thriving. Put yourself at a higher standard. So if we're going to sit through this presentation on how council should act, and I'm sure most of us, except for Jackie, will break all these rules, then let's have the higher standard, but let's have the access to go with it and not the lowest common denominator. I, I, I hear you. I just think that um, I don't see what I'm going to be able to get out of. And, I, and I've, I've... You don't, you don't see. Well, you I, don't here, see because you can't see. Here, here's, here's my, I, I had access to every room in the, in every, every room in the building when I first got elected. Uh, I don't know. If that, in fact, I found out that out because the week after I got elected, I couldn't sleep one night because I don't really sleep. And I came down and I, opened, I wanted to see how many doors I could open. And I could open up every single door. But Wes, that's a, normal, that's a normal reaction. The fact that you got out of bed and came down here and opened every <laughs> single door says, hey, I love being a council member. I want to make my city better. I'm looking for ways to make my city better. Did you come down and flip I, computers I, I over I and take phones but, off the hook? But, but I got a, a panic call from the city manager that's saying, a creepy. Hey, I'm sorry, getting you, out of bed. I could not <laughs> sleep. I, it happens. Oh. So I, I got a call from the, the, the city manager saying, Saying, hey, did someone steal your badge? Because you know somebody was down here at two o'clock in the morning, and and I and at that point, I think you know it was maybe about a year later that um, that access changed, and and I was fine. In fact, I didn't even notice it, and and because frankly, there was no reason for me to go into. There's no reason for me to go into accounting after hours, or to go into into HR after hours, or to go anywhere. And and I've had a couple discussions with the city manager about, hey. I really should, this should work here, or this should work at this time. And we've made little little corrections because I don't see how I could do my job better going to an empty building. I, I, I just don't. And, and I've, I currently manage about, about 100 people in different places, and, and I've never gotten anything out of going to an empty, I've never gotten, gotten anything out of going to an empty office, ever. So as a superintendent for a major construction firm, I would be issued card keys, right? And I'm running multi, multi-million dollar projects. I'm given five, ten card keys. Who do I give those keys to? I give those to the people I trust. And I say, hey, look for me. They, I have guys that I've given card keys to that see things that I don't. And I've been able to build better because of it. I may be late to a job site one morning intentionally or unintentionally. They can let the guys in. To limit access is a sign of I don't trust. To grant access is a sign of I do trust. Okay. All right. I think uh, we've been dominating this side of the room, so I know that uh, the vice mayor has had has a, a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to address a few things that that uh, Councilmember Casilla said. I I've walked into this building needing services and have been treated poorly. Mm. As an elected official, I almost wanted to go and grab my picture off the wall. Be like, I'm this guy. <laughs> um, what, but I was happy that I was treated normally. We had a whole discussion about it in uh, our, our planning ad hoc, and so uh, I was treated like a normal citizen, and I got and I got the access of what a normal citizen would be. And then I, I, there's a whole section of this that we we're we're not talking about is the fact that with previous councils, like Mr. Fuller was talking about, um, I didn't, and all of us sat in the back and were watching all of that as well, but I did, what I didn't see was the other council members taking that person to task. And I think that... Um, because, not, not, not publicly. Not publicly. Well, there you go. Um, but, and that's where it should have been done is publicly, right? And I, I think much higher of all of us. The fact is, is that, that these key cards are assigned to us so if I scan in something, they know that I scanned in something. Um, but I, I have access to that door, that door, the elevator, and the bathrooms. That's it. 
and the, the office upstairs, but I can't get into any of the other offices. My key card doesn't work. And I agree with Mr. Richens. I think that we need to have access. That's what we're asking for. And um, if, if, if you feel that you don't need that same access, then we could certainly turn your car keyed off or your card, your key card off. But that's what we're asking for. And I want you guys to consider that is that's what we're asking for, for us to do our job better. I'm willing to concede that, you know, hey, you want to, we don't want to be anywhere uh, outside of office hours, uh, something along those lines. But um, really and truly, I, I see this as a necessity for me. And I, I've, since day one, I've been in the same boat. Hey, this thing doesn't work. Oh, no, it works. It just, you're limited, was the exact phrase, as to where you can go. I don't think there's any place in the building that doesn't work during, during office hours. Go ahead. I'll let, you could use it. It doesn't open any door other than my pathway up. Oh, I mean, I, and bathrooms. Thank God. I don't, otherwise, I'd have to rip so a door off. I guess, bathroom. okay, if I can. Um, I'll get, I'll get so, back to you, Mr. Ellis. Uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Mayor, so I think maybe there's a, a connection here between access and then the other one that you wanted to um, remove, which was disrupting city staff. So do you just want a door to open, or do you want a door to open so that you can then talk to a staff member and see what's going on? So I asked, uh, I asked uh, do, not, do not disrupt staff from their job to be removed from this language. Um, the reason I is, is A, we are representatives of the people that, were, that elected us, and so if they have a question, and I'm here, I want to ask that question. Um, we are also citizens and we also have a right to talk to any staff member about anything that's going on as, as citizens. This building is an open building, but most of the doors are locked. The difference is, is that you and I know where to find people a little bit more. The average citizen with the, with the exception of a, of a, of a few don't know where to go. They would, they would walk into our, our, um, entryway and the information desk isn't currently staffed, but if they had a question that maybe went to the city clerk, I would say nine times out of 10, they're probably going into the planning department because it's right there, right? And so we know where to go a little bit quicker. And um, if I have a question because it's been asked of me and I'm here, I want to ask that question. When they say do not disrupt staff from their job, I wish and I don't mind saying this publicly, I wish that our staff was interrupted from their job because the citizens had questions and they knew where to go and get them and they were asking their questions. I wish that they were. I think that we would be all better off if our citizens were uh, you know, directly talking to staff. I think that that would be wonderful. That'd be, that'd be a good example of, of high-performing um, government. I think for me. staff would love to be interrupted by, by the, the citizens. That's their job. Absolutely. We're also citizens. And even though we are elected, but, but well, we are... We have a different... I if agree. You, if you ask a question versus a regular member of the public asks a question, you're going to get a little bit more a, a, attention. How many, Well, but that's what I was elected to do. I'm their no, representative. You weren't, you weren't elected to use your influence. No, I was to elected to be access. their representative, right? So if I'm asked a question and I don't know the answer, I'm going to ask staff or I'm going to ask Jacob where the answer is. And but so, if so, so, so we have avenues now to ask these questions. So how is it that interrupting staff is a necessary additional avenue to answer a question? So you've just acknowledged. We, have, we can ask them. We can email them. We can talk to the city manager. How is it that we need to be able to interrupt staff in order to get our answers questions? Well, then define answered? this a little bit better. I'm just taking the words exactly as they were written, right? If I ask a question of staff, does that con is that considered disrupting them? What what does disrupting mean? It's a very You're broad. Saying, it's a very so broad maybe statement. what we need to do here is little flesh it out because as I read it is I I shouldn't be walking into the city clerk's office and spending an hour talking to her about a concern that I personally have or that a resident personally has. I need to I need to speak to my one of two staff members and get a solution for my answer instead of taking an hour out of our city. I don't think side. any of us are walking into Miss Edwards' office saying, "Miss Edwards, I need you to stop whatever you're doing right now because I have a question." Yeah, but, that, well, that's, but that's, that's what I'm reading here. That's what I'm reading. Well, here. That, that's the feel, that I'm telling you from from a standpoint of when your boss, his boss, comes in to talk to you, you're gonna stop whatever you're doing because a you don't want to make your boss's boss upset. 
Well, th- and, and that that's, yes. I mean, I, I deal with that on an everyday basis. I, I you know, I, I manage a bunch of people. I've, I've had where um, my immediate uh, person that reported to me directly said, hey, could you mind maybe not coming to this meeting because you're making people, ner- you make people nervous because they don't know you as well as I do. So I've had to, you know, temper my, my visits to make sure I'm not freaking people out because, you know, I want people to feel comfortable and, and they have a job to do. So then if I come in and ask them a question, they're going to, you know, stop what they're doing and, and talk to me. So then maybe we flesh it out. So then Mr. Vice Mayor, are you in agreement then that, that walking into a staff member's office and taking up half an hour, 20 minutes of their time, whatever it may be, is a thing that we shouldn't be doing? Well, I don't think any of us would would walk in anybody's office unannounced. So this statement for me, which is why I asked for it to be removed, is far too broad. It is not specific enough for me. So would I would I call down to, if I'm up in if I'm upstairs in in the office? If would I call down and say, Hey, do you have five minutes? I want to ask you this question. Sure. I don't think that that's disrupting. So to me, this is too broad. So until they can come back with something that is actually meaningful or, or more, more closer to what's going on, then take it out. So we need to flesh it out maybe, Mr. Mayor. Mm-hmm. Say something along the lines of, you know, if it's a, a, a five-minute inquiry and it, you know, you're in the whatever, then, it, then we're comfortable with whatever it may be. But if it's something that's going to require or that, you know, it's an addition to we need to follow our current avenues, which is what we do normally, right? We speak to Mr. Ellis, finds us the answers. Sometimes that requires us to speak directly with the staff member. Sometimes it doesn't. Is that what I'm hearing, Vice Mayor? I think we could probably get closer to what 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 is actually being meant by this ask. I mean, it's real easy to say do not disrupt staff well, what, from their well, job. Why don't, why don't we go to Mr. Ellis here? And I think that because we, we have had a policy that, that basically we're we are to funnel our questions through through the city manager unless it's a simple yes or no uh, or a, a simple answer that doesn't you know doesn't demand uh, staff time and i think we've all i've been guilty of of where i, I go down the rabbit hole in fact i think uh, i've been called the the octopus <laughs> they, hydra hydra that that i you know i ask a question and then five more questions pop out um, so I've been more cognizant of that and tried to make sure that, that I'm asking, you know, I'm asking the right, so I'm being cognizant of what I think the additional questions could be and trying to limit myself so I'm not interrupting staff because they do have a job. So I'll, I'll maybe Mr. Ellis, you could delve into this one a little bit. So when I was uh, signaling earlier, we were talking about key cards and we're talking about something else here, but maybe sure. I'll delve into both. I just want, just for the record, I just want to be really clear that council has access to anything they want to see in the city. If you want to take a look and go on a tour and get into the background of any building, if you want to look at our wastewater treatment plant or stick your head inside the biosolids uh, dryer, we'll take you wherever you want to go. This is really about unsupervised or unfettered access at any hours where there's no one else there with you. There's a whole variety of reasons that I could go through why that's not something I would recommend to you. Um, I don't want to debate the point with anybody here, but I just want to be clear for the record that council can go anywhere they want in the city. We will take you to look at anything you desire to see. Uh, We've even done that, where we've done tours and then we've been given feedback that, hey, I wanted to see the basement of the HCC. They're like, I want to see the dark corner that no one gets to see and we'll, we'll arrange a time and we'll get you down there so you can see it. So as far as just having the ability to make good policy, um, I don't want anyone to leave here who's watching to get the sense that we have restricted council from getting to see any part of the city that they wish to see. And we organize tours and we invite anyone who else on council who wants to go to do that. So I think I'll leave my comments with that. I don't want to go into all of the other points of why I wouldn't recommend that for you. Um, as far as the disrupting uh, staff from their jobs, though, since that's the most recent thing we're talking about, I just want to explicitly say what this says here and just read it. Is it... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I just lost my spot. Okay, officials should avoid disrupting staff engaged in their day-to-day job functions in order to have their individual needs met. It's not intended to be overly prescriptive. What it's intended to do is express a principle, which is staff are busy in their day-to-day jobs, and you should avoid stopping in. uh, If there's five different council members, or in some cities who have seven, if council members stop in regularly to shoot the breeze with different staff, which is more oftentimes the issue, is, is just popping in and talking for a half hour. And if you get five different people doing that, 
in different staff offices, it simply can be disruptive. And council members won't know because staff are never, or I should say they will rarely tell you that you are unwelcome. They will rarely tell you, hey, I'm under a deadline, can you leave? I'm busy right now. They're instead going to be welcoming and, and, and have you in because, because we respect the role and we wanna make sure that staff are available for that. And so it's not intended to be overly prescriptive as most of these are, it is aspirational, which is be cognizant of that and avoid it where you can. It's not to say that council members should never stop by and say hi or stop in. It's, it's, a, it's a guiding principle to be cognizant of the impact that those unannounced, uh, unexpected visits can have. You never know when someone's trying to publish a dead or uh, get, a, get an agenda out or they're under the gun for any variety of projects. We're just saying, let's be cognizant of that. It's, it's not to say you're never allowed to or that we don't wanna see you. It's, it's being cognizant of the impact that, that uh, those visits can have. Thank you, Mayor. Does, Thank you. I want to follow up with Council Member uh, Richens. Does does that meet what you're interested in? No, not at all. Um, Jacob knows this. We've had this conversation for over a year now. I I disagree with them in private, and I just figured if I'm going to sit with the code conduct class, I'm going to I'm going to bring it all out. So if you're going to tell me how to behave, I'm going to tell you how I want to behave. Um, I, I know from my life, I know from running businesses, I know from just how I operate, if I don't see a full picture, then I don't make proper rules. I don't. If I, if I only see a part of the electrical panel and I don't see the switch gear behind it, I don't know what deadly things are behind me, right? I don't know what I will see if I walk through an office. I may see something that I don't think the city should be participating in, but that has been restricted. And then it goes to trust. I have the trust of 40,000 people in a district that says we want you there. We want you at City Hall. Not third floor, all floors. If you want me to call and set up a tour, that's an act of Congress around here. Because then it turns into, well, we gotta have the assistant city manager go, and then we gotta have a director go, and then we gotta set it up, and let's invite the others, and wear a hard hat. And um, it, It's not the same. It's, it's a noble gesture. And I do believe that they will set it up as such, but even then, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna be in a very controlled environment, right? If I, uh, if I go take a tour with nine city officials and some department heads and whoever that's been arranged, I'm not gonna see what I'm really looking for. I'm gonna see what they want me to see. Mm -hmm. So I, that, that doesn't help me at all. I have been elected. You all have been elected. With election comes trust. If you can trust your city manager and their staff, then they need to trust you. It's that simple. There's not a thousand reasons to limit five people who are very responsible in life access. There's just not. We all know what we're doing. We're not kids, we're not in high school. We know how to work a card key. We all have professional careers and quite sex successful at that. Give the damn access. It's about trust. It's about what you're gonna see and not see. It's not a controlled environment. I need to see an unfettered picture. And right now I don't have that. I'd like right. to add to that really quick if I could. What was interesting about the example is that we had to set up another schedule uh, to go down into the basement because both Council Member Richens and I said, well, we wanna see what's in the basement and nobody had thought of that. And so they didn't have the keys for that. And so we had to go back. Now I wanna rem remind everybody, myself, for my, but I wanna speak for myself, I have a full-time job. I have this, I'm a parent, I have activities, and I can't even schedule a one-on-one -on -one with my employee on a regular basis because my schedule is very tight. And they're asking for us to be respectful of a lot of things, but what I don't see in here is we want to be respectful of your time, right? So this is why one of the issues that I have was do not, you know, do not disrupt staff from their job. You know what? I'm a busy person, and if I've got time in this 15 minutes to ask a question, that's what's convenient for me. And so, you know, we've accommodated a lot of schedule requests and we've accommodated a lot of things. Our employees are on a four day work week that seems to make them very happy. That took a day away from us, an actual physical day. So I'm trying to be cognizant of all the things that I have to do. That we've already spent far too much time on something that we both feel is something that we need in order to do our jobs effectively. And so I'm just gonna leave it at that. I, I, 
really don't want to argue this anymore, but these are the things that we're asking for. If you guys don't want it, that's fine. You don't need to have the access. They can do amazing things with these. We can be limited to working hours only. We could be limited to a lot of different things. If you guys don't need the access, you don't need it. Then. That's not the point. We're starting, we are having a conversation about the ground rules or about the communal ground rules. It's not whether or not, listen, you are incredibly busy. You just started a new job. You're doing a lot of traveling. You know, this man doesn't sleep. This man runs his own business. I have a newborn, you know, the retired guy, you know, but, <laughs> yeah, Jim. <laughs> but, um, um, but Smart. you know, it, it, I, I can appreciate what you're saying. If I have time now, I want to take care of this now. I don't see how anything that we currently have prevents us from doing that. I, I, I do that with, I'll shoot a city manager, Ellis, a text message, or I can be here and say, can I pop in? Like, nothing stops us from doing that. It's, what I'm reading here is, we just don't have unfettered access and should be cognizant of staff, who's not our staff, because we are a city council, city manager form of government. So again, it goes back to the kind of rules that our government, like, the rules that we have, that our, our government is founded on, which is, we are an oversight we don't manage right. staff. I think we've all had that conversation or that lecture about we don't tell staff what to do. I hate it, and it's the hardest thing for me, but I, I, have, I have done that pretty, pretty well. So we're asking questions or, or whatnot. And so I, I know but that I'm we're, not saying we're, that that's no. – uh, what I'm saying is it doesn't, this doesn't prevent you from doing that. These, yes, it does. No, it, yes, what it, did I, you find in the I, basement? I, I'm, what I'm did gonna, you find I'm in gonna, that basement that is making? Like, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna bifurcate <laughs> these issues. It was pretty cool. You're welcome, Dean. Oh, I'm gonna goodness. bifurcate these issues. So I want to separate the two issues about the key cards, and I want to and and disrupting staff because they've somehow conflated into one. Mm -hmm. I'm still that we need to have unfettered access with the key cards. I'm fine with. Uh, office hours or business hours because I don't want to be, I'm too scared to be here in this building by myself at night. Wow. So I, I don't want to be here anyway. We wouldn't know. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to go into the old police building. I don't want to do none of that stuff, but if oh, I either. want to go somewhere, I want to go somewhere. Um, I currently don't have access with this to even, to even go talk to my other employee, the city well, that, manager, the city that's attorney. That's clearly a mistake because I, I, that happened with mine. It should be corrected. And, and that, that it's was not corrected. Well. I tried it the other day. It did yeah. work. Okay. So but that, that I'm the, still uh, saying the key word that Jackie mentioned is oversight. Right now we're on undersight. We well, don't I, have I, oversight. I think it sounds like that we may have different access because or maybe I, we I just think, think the I definition of oversight is different. Our oversight in this, in our form of government, is it's like an hourglass. We've got two staff, and we oversight, and so trust, and 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 we speak on trust, yeah. and trust goes both staff ways. Staff doesn't own this building. It's not their building. No, it's the city. This isn't building. the city manager's building. This isn't staff's building. None of that. None of that belongs to city staff. This is okay. our building. Correct. This is the citizens' I think, building. I think uh, Mr. Ellis had a quick comment. Right. Mayor, just did an effort to move the conversation along. It would yeah. be appropriate for anyone to make a motion, and then you can take a vote on that, and that would give us direction just to allow us to uh, to move forward, um, not trying to cut anything short. Uh, just if you want to bifurcate those two questions, that would be totally appropriate to do so, and someone could make a motion, and that could... Uh, find a second and then a vote could happen and then we could continue. I don't think we have to decisions. vote. I think Alvaro is giving his direction, correct? Correct. It's not a final vote. It's right. it's a way of making a decision of whether okay. we say yes or no to That's any fine. particular I, clause. Like I said, I, I, it's good to have the discussion. It's good that we're doing, we're doing it here and it's good that we're disagreeing because we're having a conversation and which is a good thing. Um, so I think, I think there is clear direction for us to provide a path forward for uh, the items minus the ones that we've been talking about. And yeah, it sounds like we need to like vice mayor's comments about, you know, what is read here and what we mean by them, I think is a really valid point. I yeah. think we need to flesh those out. Right. So like the point on, uh, you know, B3 uh, and B4, the disruption of city staff and um, well, and the crit public criticism, I think we need to maybe provide an example of what it is and what it isn't so that. When we vote on this, there's a there's a there's an agreement, because I don't think we're that far apart. I just think that what we think it means sure. is a different. That's where I think the the hiccup is. 
So to that point, Mayor, if I can facilitate yeah, a little bit. So what I have so far, I think um, from Council Member Daddario, it's A, B, practice civility and decorum in discussions and debate. I'm sorry, Vice Mayor, I apologize, sir. Um, apologies. Uh, Vice Mayor Daddario, uh, is it, do we have the three items that you listed? The first, was that practicing civility and decorum in discussions and debate that you wanted removed? Did I get that one right? No, the, the so. If we just list them, then we can take them one by one. Yeah, I, I apologize because I, I pulled them off of the presentation. So B3. But now I'm looking at the, uh, yeah, I got it right here. Now I'm looking at the um, uh, the attachment. So it would be um, B3. B3, do not disrupt staff or city staff from their jobs. If we can get some clarification on that and kind of flush that out and come to something that I think works for everybody. Sure, so I can speak to that one. Um, I can. I would happily carve out the city manager and city attorney. You may disrupt at any point that we are available <laughs> anytime during the day. We have no problem with that. That's why we're here. Uh, this is speaking to staff below the city manager or other than the city attorney. Um, and, uh, and it means showing up unannounced primarily. You may call any of the directors with a simple question uh, anytime during working hours if you're, if you're calling them on their cell phone. Um, for any question that you have. And if they're available, they'll answer the phone. That's that's perfectly acceptable. It's really about in-person visits. You can email staff, those staff, uh, with those same questions at any time that you'd like to, and they'll respond when they can. It's about in-person visits uh, during during the workday. That's what that's about. Okay. So I, I, I would prefer that explanation, but the in-person I'm gonna push back on because I don't mind asking somebody if they have a few minutes because I have a question or I want, I have a question. It's usually a question that I want to ask. But if I'm here, I would rather walk down to their office or, or whatnot rather than pick up the phone and call them. However, I could pick up the phone and call them and say, do you have five minutes? I'm in the building. If you want to reword this a little bit more along those lines, but I, I guess fundamentally I'm also having... A problem because, you know, I am the I am the conduit for all of the people that I represent. And if they have a question, or if I get a question, we get questions all the time. I email you questions all the time, and and for the most part, it's never a question that you answer. It's a question that you have to get an answer. Right? It's usually like the Rincon Road being closed or or whatnot. It's not it's not your area of expertise. You you went to Savat and asked Savat. So I, I guess I'm just having a, a, a problem with saying, hey, you can't talk to city staff in person. Um, so just as a point of clarification, we've never said that you can't stop, talk to city staff in person. We're talking about disrupting them with un, unexpected appointments. I don't want to debate the point with you, though. Hopefully that's clarified what we mean by it. And if there's other, any, any other clarifying questions, happy to answer those. Then Otherwise, it's just it? a matter of, of voting on it. Then can we reword it from the way that it is? Um, happy to entertain that. What would you like it to be rewarded to? Well, uh, <clears throat> first of all, the do not disrupt city staff from their job should should um, be be taken out. It should be stricken, really, at, at some point. See, I, mean, I don't. I don't agree with that, and I don't think that uh, the councilmember Casillas does as well. And, and frankly, we may be at a point here that the. There's not a quorum. There's not enough people here to make a, a definitive decision one way or the other. I don't know how Councilmember Richens feels about that one. I'm with Tony today. Okay. If All right. Tony so kills it, I so kill we're two it. two. So we're going to have to come back and so maintain status quo. So yeah. so essentially, Tony or I'm sorry, Vice Mayor, would be uh, making a motion. Yep. That motion would fail, on and uh, we would move forward as it is right now. And this is still, of course, would be coming back to council, and you right. will have a full quorum for final decision on anything. Yep. What are we voting on? We're not voting. We're not we're voting today. Guidance, we're giving direction right? today. Yeah, providing guidance. To be clear. When I use the term voting, I'm, I'm seeking some, you can call it thumbs up, um, but it's a way of giving us direction of, okay, do we have two in favor or one in favor? Right. So, you're not so, making, taking any final action, you're simply giving so direction. If I can offer, um, uh, uh, we're not voting, but if no, I can no, offer I a motion, if I can offer like a suggestion that maybe just the items that yes. Vice Mayor D'Addario has concerns with, if maybe we can work on some word wording before, between now and the council meeting where we have maybe a couple of alternatives. Like, I will type something up 
and then maybe vice mayor can type something up. And those can be the alternatives that come the day of we're vo voting on. So okay. four, three, or B3 will have B3 option A, B3 option B2, or B, sorry. Okay. Remain consistent. I like that. Um, and so we flesh out this concern a little bit more and have options so that when it comes before us to actually vote on it during a city council meeting, we can say which ones we liked. Okay, so then, so then that's that's three. What do you then, think, Vice Mayor? That's good. Yeah, I could, I can, I could um, word this differently and submit that for when this comes back to, to council. Yeah. And we can, if we have five people to make a vote, then perfect. Okay, right. and I can do the same, yep. and then we can have options. So that was for like uh, that's B three. B four is the next one, correct? Yep, B four. The never publicly criticize or an individual staff member. I, the the problem that I have with that is that I'm not. Um, I, I usually, in fact, I can't think of a reason that I would say something critical about anybody that is staff or a field level or non director level. I should say, but. Um, First of all, you can be critical and be professional. Mm. And so there's no, there's really no um, delineation here. It's just don't say anything bad about any staff member. So I, I absolutely will not listen to that as far as, you know, that being something that I'm going to engage in. I can be critical and professional. Okay. And that needs to be said okay. in public because the first thing that they talked about in this was the lack of trust amongst um amongst you know the city uh, about their about their um, local government and if I'm not saying the good and the bad in public then I deserve to have lost that I trust. think fr frankly then maybe there's so, three of us that agree with that but just put in the word professional so we'll just but maybe we just consistent right, right. so for Fair these enough. things we will work on the word choice and come back with some, and then there was a third one yeah it was be professional and respectful when interacting with other, other officials electeds. okay yeah so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you there are some other elected people that I have had interactions with that I do not respect. Now, I will limit my interaction with them, but to be perfectly honest, there are some folks that are elected officials that give us a bad name, and I will limit my interaction with them, but... Um, but, but this one, Mr. Vice Mayor, it does say be professional and respectful. Sure, I could be right? professional. So, sure. so there's no... There's, there, there isn't but respectful um, is something that's earned. <laughs> you guys have we are terms. mincing words here. Okay, yes. but we will work on that one too. Yep. So those are the three that, that Vice Mayor D'Addario will submit. Some, I will submit a draft. Anyone else who wants to submit a draft? And then we can bring that back. Uh, and when we vote on it, we have a full council. We have options. Yep. I like cool. that. Cool. And then there was a fourth one. It wasn't on here. So I'm not giving, I'm not giving uh, suggestions about um, what was written. But one of the things that I feel strongly about is... Um, you know, we have a, 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 an obligation to be prepared on this dais. And I want yeah, to make I like sure, that. I want to make sure that if I'm going to memorialize anything, I would really like something along those lines being memorialized. I'm, I could try and write something up. I don't know, maybe 18 pages long, but um, I, I, we, we all have an obligation to. I, I think I saw actually, I think the, the uh, Mr. Durla showed me an example from another city that, that had a paragraph that I, I loved and I, and thank you for bringing it up because I'd forgotten about it. It was about being, basically being coming to a meeting prepared. Sure. Yep. We, we certainly, uh... now it turns off. <laughs> You're done. Your three minutes are up, Mr. <laughs> Silly Manager. Sorry. My mic's been on for like two hours. <laughs> okay. So you'll bring that back? Bring that back okay. All right. So Mr. Ellis will bring that back. All right. And I think that was that was it, right? For this. Right. But we, have we have not the access. resolved. So we have I, not I, resolved I know, the we'll, access. We'll leave that to you guys and how. I don't know how to move forward because I, I mean, I, I'm sticking to what our government looks like and I can't see. I can't see. I, I don't see. think you've done the research. You, you've just sat through an hour less and you don't see because you haven't seen. But you can't tell me what it is that's in that basement that is so dire. What, what if it was? What What if you went into the basement and you found a kegerator in there? What you wouldn't know, right? Until you went in, you don't know what you see until you see it. You don't know what's going on in your city until you see well, it. Trust. What happened, we're, we're trusting, what happened our, we're to trusting trust? him and trusting our. Huh? What happened our, to our trust? Directors. Mayor, my mic's working again. Can I make one more comment? Yes, go ahead. With your permission. 
um, the role of the council is not operational oversight. And I know that that's a daring thing to say in a meeting because <laughs> it feels like I'm, I'm laying something down. It is policy oversight. And so if you have a concern with operations, that goes to me. My job is to oversee operations in the, of, the, of the city. And of course, I get feedback all the time. I welcome it. We need it. But it's not the council's role as a policymaker to provide operational oversight. That is a staff role. And that's fundamentally the difference here. And I, I don't want to enter into the debate any more than oh, I already good. have. You can mix them, though. So yeah, you can enforce the operation and you can conduct the operational oversight, but you don't know what your operational oversight is until that policy has been established, right? Incorrect. So, you're, so there is no operational oversight role of an elected body. Other I'm not, than I'm not asking for funds. operational oversight. I'm asking for policy. So you operate under policy. I've been told that many times. You're correct. So in order to have a policy to operate by, someone has to set that policy. Who's setting that policy for the basement, right? Yeah, but the policy is, if, you're, if your example is that we found a kegerator, I think that there's a policy. I don't know if there's a kegerator in there or not, but I can, I can well, talk I mean, to that, four that, other individuals that I, uh, I vote with and say, hey, we need to set a policy where there's no kegerators in the basement. I, I don't know what I see until I see it. You can operate it if the policy comes down the road that let's get rid of all kegerators, which I'm pretty sure Steiner won't vote in favor of. <laughs> But, uh, I love how many jabs are making at his expense without him here. Poor man's probably watching <laughs> this. And by the way, this meeting had been over an hour ago. But Jacob, here. you can enforce the removal of the of the kegerator. You can operate the kegerator and getting it out of here. However you want to do it, do it. But until a policy is set, you have no way to operate. We need to be able to see what we're setting policy for. And this is going to go back and forth, and you and I are never, ever going to agree. I just have to convince one more person. I've already lost Wes and Jackie. <laughs> so it's all on Steiner's shoulders right now, and I'm not using any proper names after Donna's lecture. <laughs> Council member Steiner, by so the way. Uh, let's just leave it at that. I'll lose and uh, bring it back, and, and we'll have it at that. Tony and I will lose unless we can convince. Steiner. I just, you know, and I and I and that, that um, it makes me sad because I don't I don't feel like we we can be or that we have to be in a place where you feel like you've lost. It, so. It's a loss. I, I just, the loss I'm trying is to a loss. find I'll where it is. Loss. I'm trying to find where it is that we can find the common ground for us to do the work that we're supposed to be doing and to get you that right. And I just don't see this as being. That I don't I, see access as being the thing that you need in order to do this job I th well. I think there is some issues be the fact that it sounds like that you and I have a different level of access than than. Um, hey, look, I like I, so our I'll badge be, to go to I'll see the to city attorney, that. right? Yeah, that during, needs to during, that yeah. needs to be fixed. Yeah. I, I'll absolutely. give you the perfect example. We've bitched about the I've bitched about the heritage room forever and a day before elected and after elected. I still don't have any access over there, and I don't even have time to go over there right now. But the truth of it is, history is locked up. There is so much right now that is not available to the citizens because there is no access. When you limit access, you limit progress. It's that simple. And it's also a sign of trust, Jackie. If, if you're going to hire, if five of us are going to hire a city manager and say, we are trusting you with operational control, and then he turns around and says, well, F you, you're not getting access to anything. That's not right. If I can trust Jacob, he can trust me. It's that simple. Trust works two ways. When you start limiting your counsel, you invite problems. So I think that's a really good example. I'm sorry. I know we keep talking. This is what this is what we're democracy looks like. If I may, and then, and um, obviously we're not going to we're not going to solve this problem this evening. But I'm, I'm talking that, about the right? Heritage Room is a really great example because when you saw this problem, we started to discuss the policy for access to it. Did we not? And it yeah, came before us and it changed. You know how long it took? It took you getting took, elected. It, it took years. It took getting elected. And then it took a conversation with the city attorney because we couldn't bring anything out of that room. And by the grace of God, Jacob agreed to go over there and say, yeah, this is dysfunctional. But it took a lot. And by the way, had I never had access to the back of the heritage room, had I never not been kicked out of there a few times, <laughs> I wouldn't have even known to call that there's a problem, right? Mm. It's because I had gone back there. It's because I had snuck back in there. It's Thought because it. I had been kicked out of there. That's how the problem got fixed. I'm not saying that I went over there and 
kicked down bookshelves and said, this is all wrong. I'll let Jacob do the operational um, control. And I trust him, right? And yes, it's been flushed out in the council. It's we're going to have a new heritage room or some kind of a heritage room. He's operationally doing a great job with that, I think, I hope. But from a policy that we set on the heritage room is because I had access, Wes had access, and Wes can sit here and tell you how hard it is to get in that room. There's still a room in that room. We still haven't gotten in. We still haven't gotten in. I still have no access. I'll get you in this week if you'd like to. <laughs> so, yes. Without I, a large group of people. Yeah. <laughs> but because access was given legally or illegally to that room, we now have better policy coming out of it. It's that simple. So then uh, asking for... But you didn't for, need unfettered access you, to have that. That's what I'm saying. Like, you could still say, still hey, Jacob, I want to go check out this thing. I, I'm saying if you, if you set up an appointment with Roger to go look at something, you will see a very polished whatever you're going to look at. You will. You want to go see the dryer for whatever that biosolids is? Awesome, by the way. <laughs> right. But you're going to put a hard hat on, and then you're going to march with nine people, and they'll clean it before they get there, and they'll get rid of all the trip hazards and everything that possibly they don't want you to see, you won't see. Right? But if you had access to go into that plant, and I don't think any of us do, um, I may see something that says, hey, our operational guy may need some policy on this to make it better. And I don't know that that's true. But that's what it is. You have limited, and I don't know why you and Wes are on this limiting kick, but you have limited. I'm just, you've these are ground yourself rules and I, and that we're setting not just for ourselves, but for councils to come. And so if it's, a, if it's abused in, by a future council, that future council can change the policy then, right? We don't go to the lowest common denominator right now. That That's, when you set rules, <laughs> rules are always for the lowest common denominator, right? It's, hey, don't ride your skateboard on the sidewalk, not because maybe you won't be able to do it, but because some kid will fall and trip. Rules are always lowest common denominators. If you want to be a high-functioning city, then be accessible. Don't, don't go to the lowest common denominator. If we elect a knucklehead, trust the other four that they'll manage the knucklehead. Trust the citizens that they'll get rid of the knucklehead. Don Fuller, the... The uh, person he's referencing earlier served one term, one term, and he was out, right? If something's broke with an elected official, there is a way to remove them, right? And he has four colleagues. Okay. So if, I mean, that's part, of the, that's part of the policy here, too, is to do that. So that's yeah. is setting right. up a but, policy. But we're, to Jackie's point, she's like, we may have this dork down the line that just screws everything up. Don't limit yourself to his limitations or her limitations. Be don't don't be the kite with the string, right? I think that was a microaggression on your part there. That's okay. Don't I don't know what I said, but it's not a big deal. Don't be the kite with the string. There's always a string holding the kite to fly, right? Don't be the kite. Okay. Be the bird. Fly. Right. I think I think in the terms of time and everybody getting, you know, I, got all night. I know uh, you do. I, I actually a little bit more that I that I'd like to say because I don't want to leave without this getting done. You know, one of the things that I'm going to use that same example of that basement. Did you know in that basement there's like six or seven rooms that are empty? And also underneath part of the old city hall, there's rooms that are empty. And if you want to tie that back to policy, if we have discussions down the line where somebody's saying, hey, we can't do something because we don't have the room for it. And we say, you know what, don't we have rooms under, in, in the, underneath the, uh, the old city hall? We saw them. We, they were there. And... Yeah, but you you didn't you still got to see them. Absolutely, we did. But you, you scheduled but we an appointment. Didn't, and saw it. We didn't know what we were going to see until we got there. Sure. Right? We we didn't know. I didn't know the history of some of those rooms and what they were used for. And you know, council council member Richards is actually very brilliant in saying we don't know. I wish I wish that I could tell you, hey, I'm going to walk through and this is exactly what I'm going to see. I can't. But we see a lot of different things. And it's not our job to, to, at that point, make that correction or do whatever. It's our job to bring it to him and say, hey, you know what? I was walking through, and this is what I saw. And believe me, I've walked through some of these offices and seen some things, and I'm like, hmm, it's very interesting. I don't know what I'm going to see. But if I'm limited as to what I can see, then I'm never going to know. And so that, that fundamentally very, very much I don't, bothers I don't think me. there's a limitation. I think there's a limitation there of that you 
you don't just get to go wherever you want after hours. You're in hours. I don't want to go you, after you, hours. You can go. You can. I mean, that's clearly not the I, I've policy. I've said I'm, right okay, now. I'm okay with you know being you know business hours or whatnot. I just don't want to be. I think limited. that's. I think that's okay right now. It's I not. I, I'm. I'm telling you. I think there's a mistake with your their card, and it sounds like that Mr. Ellis will fix that immediately. There we go. We're good. See, the problem solved. We're not solved. good. We're not good, and it's not solved. It'll come back to council, and, and that's fine. Apparently, that's okay. we have to get a third vote, but. It is what it is. Okay. I'll make sure you don't get the access when we get that third vote done. Wow. <laughs> so mean. You don't need it. <laughs> okay. So with that, I think we are, uh, no, do we have, uh, no, we already had public comment or any <laughs> additional public comment, but we're good. So, Thank you for the feedback, Mayor. We will prepare this uh, for an upcoming council meeting. Okay. So we are adjourned until May 4th. Correct. So may the 4th be with you. You like that?